Okay, and welcome back to hour number three. That was uh, quite a good first two hours. 9-11 is today. We're going to talk to a young woman who has not been on this program before. She has done an extraordinary amount of research, however, and I assume she's standing by there. Rebecca, are you there? I am, yes, I am. Where are you? Don't have to tell me the town. What, what state are you in? What part of the country? I'm in the, the western part of the United States. Good. Right that narrowed it right down. I like that. <laughs> All right. Rebecca Roth is our guest, and uh, I've subtitled it 9-11 Who Done It. Rebecca has done some extraordinary work, and I want her just to kind of jump into that, and, and we'll follow along and, and chime in here and there and ask her to amplify and, and further elucidate on things, but... What got you pulled into this? Uh, you know, I uh, stopped flying in about 2004. and you were I really a, a hostess. Yes, I was. I was an international purser and a flight attendant for about 30 years at the time of 9-11. Wow. Um, I flew until about 2004, and then I never really looked back at the airline or 9-11 or anything else. I uh-huh. saw it unfold on television just like everyone else did. Yeah. And um, in 2008, eight nine, somewhere in there, in my retirement, I thought, well, I'll just write that novel everyone I flew with told me I should write. So I started to write a novel just about life in the jet stream and what it was like to do what I did for a living. And I traveled and I saw lots of great places, met lots of neat people all around the world. Uh-huh. I thought, well, this would be really kind of fun to base a novel on. And then um, about, I don't know, chapter two or three into my novel, I decided I'd I'd introduce a Middle Eastern character, and I wanted to grab a name. So I Google searched 19 Arab hijackers from 9-11. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, up in front of me came a BBC article written September 23, 2001. How did I miss this? Six of the hijackers were still alive. At least four of them were professional airline pilots out of the Middle East. And I was just absolutely shocked. Cause yeah, I, that, aren't there more still alive? I think, there's uh, actually ten. Ten, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, they, yeah that, I can see how that knocked you over, sure. <laughs> it sure did. And I, I was like, I was so shocked. And then I I read a little bit about these, uh, you know, hijackers still alive. I started Googling, mm-hmm. and started looking, and then I started discovering other things. I set that novel aside and did thousands of hours of research into 9-11 because I have to honestly tell you, even though I never looked back and I couldn't really go there uh, mentally. Right. I knew from day one that cell phone calls cannot be made from altitude. And when I started hearing that, and I started hearing that the flight attendants themselves were making cell phone calls, Uh reservations and different family, I knew that was wrong. It's not protocol. It can't happen. And then... I saw and heard so many things that were wrong that my I just put my brain on, uh, don't go there. Look, I'm not going to go there. Because I flew for a few years after that. And listen, when you're flying, your safety net is NORAD and the U.S. military. And I've had jets scrambled for me before for different incidences over my career. Huh. And they come to your wingtips, and it's very frightening because sometimes you can see their arms, armament hanging from them. And uh, they'll maybe shoot you down. You just don't know. But the feeling is horrible, except they do scramble and come to, to your rescue in six minutes. On that day, it took almost two hours. And... After Whoops, nine, something wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, my first question was, um, well, when somebody called me and said, turn your television on right now, and I'd just gotten home from Europe, and I'd, I'd come in as a purser, so mm-hmm. I hadn't seen any FAA uh, warnings about hijackers or anything, or Al-Qaeda, and we'd never been told about uh, Tim Osman, I mean, uh, Osama bin Laden. Tim or, Osman, yes. <laughs> or I later on found out he was a CIA asset in the yeah. mid-'80s. To start up the Mujahideen for the CIA. And so I I didn't know about him or um, Osama bin Laden or Al-Qaeda. They had never told us or warned us that this could be possible, a hijacking group. Mm -hmm. And I was was so shocked. I saw that second plane go into the South Tower like a hot knife through butter. And honestly, I thought it was either trick photography or a new rendition of War War of the Worlds. Wow. 
I thought it was somebody was joking because Mm -hmm. planes cannot disappear into a steel building. They're made of aluminum. And if you've ever seen an aircraft that's been in a real major hailstorm or hit by a large bird, they do a lot of damage. Those those planes are very fragile. I've seen them take a bird strike and a lightning Mm -hmm. strike and Mm -hmm. and see what happens. So. I I really thought it was some kind of trick photography, and I, I really I had jet lag, and I didn't know what was going on. And the person on the other end of the phone was saying, it's terrorists. And I'm like, well, you know, later on that day, I said, well, how did they get control of NORAD? <laughs> how did they control our military? That was my main question is, so how could somebody on a, you know, the laptop and a satellite phone right. stop NORAD from scrambling? And how, uh, how many hours? Well, they were an hour and 45 minutes, I believe. My goodness. Close to yeah. New York. Yeah, yeah. But it's really interesting what happened. Well, then we get the story about, uh, who was it, Leon Panetta? I can't remember now. About Dick Cheney being told. Yeah, and... that was Norman Mineta. Norman Mineta, not Leon was, Panetta. Yeah, see, with <clears> this <throat> Kind of yeah. like they could be a part of the same song. Mm-hmm. He was actually in the bunker with uh, Vice President Dick Cheney. Mm-hmm. A young soldier would come in and say to the Vice President, uh, the aircraft is 20 miles out, sir. He'd give him mileage checks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Was... And um, so he said the airplane is five miles out, sir. Do your orders still stand? And Norman Mineta, you know, he's on record saying this. I b- believe he said it at the 9-11 Commission hearings, I think think and um or before that i know he's certainly on record just saying that it's very well known and dick cheney said have my my orders still stand my have i changed no no my orders still stand as if he knew what was about to happen and shortly thereafter just a moment uh something hit the pentagon and so what I found in looking for my second book, because I've just released the second book, Methodical Deception, mm-hmm. is I followed up with people like Norman Mineta. And ah, very good. From the FAA. Yeah. And I know I'm going to send you these books as soon as um, I want to send you hardbacks. And I think oh, they'll thank you. come I, in on, on Wednesday for the new book. I and, appreciate uh, that. The first book is uh, Methodical Illusion. Uh-huh. And the second book is... Methodical deception. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yeah. And so what I did was I followed up with people that I think should have lost their jobs that day mm-hmm. and and found where they went and where they're sitting, what board of directors they're sitting ah, on. Ah, yeah. What, they got absolute. rewarded. They got, uh, oh, yeah. they got, they got yeah. big, the big prize. Yeah. Yeah, really big prize. And, you know, it's interesting it's talking about Norman Mineta. You know, if you listen to the official story of 9-11... Boy, one, a ra- are you right. A rapper would love those two guys in a song. <laughs> they would. <laughs> and if you listen to the official story, they claim mm-hmm. there was a gun on board. Mm-hmm. There was a, a bombs on some mm-hmm. of the aircraft. Mm-hmm. Ives and box cutters and pepper spray and mace. Mm-hmm. Those were all illegal to bring on board an aircraft at mm-hmm. the time of 9-11. And so you have to look at who was running security. And these are the things that I looked at in every single detail on 9/11. Well, and unfortunately, I, uh, we know now who was. So tell us who was on, who was running the security. Yeah, this is very interesting. There was a company started out of Israel called ICTS International, mm-hmm. and they had a subsidiary in the United States called Huntley USA. And I remember seeing ICTS and Huntley USA almost everywhere I went. Hmm. It, that because that was before That's, the, really so they they penetrated the entire uh-huh. area aeronautical business industry and got into practically every airport exactly but what's really weird is the company ICTS was started by an Israeli convict who had been convicted of um, f- making fraudulent documents campaign finance uh, problems and two or three other things he'd actually was in prison and so he gave the company uh, control to somebody else in Israel and they brought that company to the United States as Huntley USA and for some reason United and American both signed up with them they controlled almost all of their 
security, and uh, almost every other airport in the United States did. But what's really weird, Huntley or ICTS International runs security uh, all over the EU. They ran security when Richard Reed, the tennis shoe bomber, came through Charles de Gaulle. Yeah. They ran security also through Amsterdam Schiphol Airport when the panty bomber that almost took Northwest Airlines down going into Detroit on a Christmas morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, Same, they ran that security. They ran security at Boston, Logan, Dulles International, Washington, D.C., and Newark on 9-11. So you think, okay, now how did they get bombs and knives and all of that stuff? So at three airports, now we know of five actually, where supposed terrorists with bombs Uh had allowed through Huntley. Guess who's sitting on their board of directors right now? The Secretary. Of transportation, no. Norman Mineta. Oh, no. Now, think about this. In reality, they failed yeah. to stop the shoe bomber, the underwear bomber, yeah. and everything that happened on 9 11. But one thing I did discover is there were not 19 Arabs on the real passenger manifest. That's a story that's generated just by the FBI as mm-hmm. part of the cover up of what really did take place. Mm-hmm. Wow, Rebecca. Wow. What a journey you've been on. What you have seen, uh, you you know too much. Uh, it's in your books. Uh, I'm very happy about that. I hope that they do very well. Uh, it's time that we get the truth of this out. Uh, the, the, the words, the terms, inside job, really don't even come close to the, uh, the dynamics involved in this tragedy. It was huge. Mm-hmm. We were sold out. By our own? Uh, will you tell us? Well, that's true. And what happened to me was I um, I immediately, once I started to see the hijackers were alive, I, I found an FBI document. was a transcript of the two flight attendants from Flight 11. They were the first two people to call and to contact anyone that they were being uh, hijacked or something ah. was wrong. Uh-huh. So it was very fortunate because I just put my flight attendant shoes back on and said, okay, I'm going in there with them. And I listened to every word. And Betty Ong called reservations, which is a line no flight attendant would call because you're on hold just like you guys are, just like passengers, 10, 15 sure. minutes on hold. Mm-hmm. And if you're calling in in a real emergency like a hijacking, you can't be on the phone for a long period of time because if a real hijacker saw you on the phone, they'd probably you're toast. Kill you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was not part of the protocol, was to make phone calls outside. But we had two flight attendants that did that. One used a cell phone, and one used an onboard phone. And Betty Ong called reservations, and she said, one hijacker as a he has sprayed pepper sprayer mace in business class, and we can't breathe in business class. And I read that again, and I thought, wait a minute. Now, what went through my 30 years career in my mind? Uh Uh-huh. Leaving Honolulu with that cheap perfume, that flowery stuff they'd spray in, and and uh, the whole airplane would fill up with it. Somebody sprayed it, you know, everybody smelled like puka flowers or something. Or dropping a duty-free rum somewhere in the airplane, everyone would smell it. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, if this airplane were pressurized at altitude uh-huh. and some- sprayed something as bad as pepper spray or mace, both mm-hmm. of which are not legal. Okay, go through the whole plane including the hijackers, would be suffering from it. And yet both of those flight attendants were on the phone for 27 minutes. Neither of them ever coughed, choked, gagged, or said, my eyes are killing me. I can't breathe. I, I'm having trouble. They didn't. You see what they said? There was gas only up in one section. And they talked on the phone for nearly a half an hour. And so she said something else. She said he stood upstairs. And that to somebody else, that means nothing. But I know there are only stairs on a 747. She was on a 767. And I knew since they were not pressurized Uh and she was calling, Uh they were on the ground somewhere in Uh a hangar. And there are stairs in every corner of a hangar. And so what I did was I thought, well, then 20 minutes from Boston, let me find where they could be. And I knew that those aircraft, because they were heavy, we landed where they were full of fuel to go from coast to coast. Even though the loads were light, they're still landing what we call heavy in the industry. They needed at least a 10,000-foot runway, and lo and behold, if I didn't find a reserve Air Force base, Uh. within 
18 minutes of Boston. Oh, and perfect. Four yeah. aircraft were taken over remotely using the flight termination system, mm-hmm. which was sold to the airlines. Mm-hmm. To Boeing first from a company called SPC Corporation. Another Israeli company. Interestingly enough, not only that, the CEO of that company was Rabbi Dov Zakheim, who was also the comptroller of the Pentagon. Dov who- Zakheim, who on September the 10th <laughs> announced that there was, what was it, uh, $2 trillion missing mm-hmm. from the Pentagon budget? Yep, he was the banker. He was the comptroller there. He was also the CEO of SPC Corporation. Unbelievable. They they also have a subsidiary company at SPC called TriData. And after the 1993 bombing that Uh the FBI did of the World Trade Center, TriData got most of the reconstruction and got the blueprints for the towers. Oh, my. So here they come in the early 90s, and they sell... They sell these to Boeing. Boeing comes to the commercial carriers in the United States, and they sell it by this. In the event of a hijacking, Mm -hmm. and a hijacker could take over the cockpit, we can land the aircraft remotely where it will be uh, liberated by a hostage rescue team. And I said, well, who's we? Who's we can take control remotely? Who are those we? I found who they are in my 9-11 investigation. Oh, so congratulations! This, wow, you you got you solved. Uh, who done it? Yeah, uh, and it's you, and that's really it. the methodical illusion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and since I was in cognitive dissonance, I was afraid to look into this. And mm-hmm. and really, what slapped me a- across the face was finding the hijackers were still alive, and that the FBI was being sued by the Saudi government for stealing the identity. And I thought to myself, how difficult would it be for a professional airline person to travel around having that to live with, that you're one of the 9-11 hijackers? I mean, that was worldwide um, information. And they're still, to this day, in Wikipedia as the guilty parties, and they're still I I Didn't one of them sue? I I know the Saudi government was threatening to sue the FBI. I could never find a lawsuit. I'm assuming... Maybe they didn't then. I don't know. Somebody must have gotten some sort of payoff. I can't find any any documentation that a lawsuit was settled. It may okay. Be- well, we know that the Israelis were involved in this uh, up to their eyeballs and further. Who do you think was the ultimate mastermind? Was this an Israeli op? It appears to be um, pretty much a Mossad operation. Uh huh. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. That would have been uh, my guess. Yeah. yeah. And so when I, as I was going through and, and dissecting these phone calls from the two flight attendants, I noticed that Amy Sweeney, the other flight attendant that called in, she made a mistake no flight attendant would ever make. And you can rest she assured. She did it on purpose. She did. Yeah. And when I finished reading these two girls' transcripts from an FBI document, I said to my husband, they just needed a flight attendant to read this because I can hear everything they're saying. And I could. Oh, my. <laughs> The hijacker, again, one he, was in 9B. And later on, she called back and she said, oh, I made a mistake. The hijacker's in 10B. It was 9B was stabbed. But I looked to see who 9B was because no flight attendant would make that mistake because Uh she didn't have any guarantee she could make a second phone call. You never make that statement unless you were 150% sure because in a hijacking, we get that plane on the ground Come hell or high water, we're going to bring it to the ground, and there it will be liberated by a hostage rescue team. So I looked in to see who 9B was, and lo and behold, he was part of the Israeli Defense Forces Special Operations Unit called Sayeret Met Call. They are highly trained assassins. He was an what anti- What was in that Levin? Or, uh, Le- what was his name? Daniel Lewin. Lewin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so what I found was he was a highly trained assassin. He was an anti-hijacking specialist. Oh, good Lord. He was so a hostage rescue team. These were the people, when there was a hijacking out of Israel uh, and going into anywhere, and Abi anywhere, they would be sent in and they would liberate the plane, just like I told you earlier with the flight termination system how it was sold to us. So that means this guy in 9B, who was, by the way, he grew up in Denver. He was fluent in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. So the guys, if they were really sitting behind him planning the new Pearl Harbor event of this hijacking, he would have been able to hear them perfectly. 
and and understand exactly what they were planning and do something because you know as they continued to read about him his friends from the israeli defense forces Mm -hmm. they said about him he could kill any human being with a pen and a credit card well he was traveling on business because he was the ceo of a company called akamai technologies Hmm. also Hmm. located in massachusetts (laughs) And so I thought, well, gee, now that's really interesting because the hostage rescue person knows exactly how everything on a Boeing works. The yeah. PA system. Sure. Said, we sure. Can, oh, sure. Sure. We can call the pilots. We can call. We can make a PA announcement that'll go off in the cockpit uh-huh. and the cabin or in different parts of the aircraft. He would know how the doors work. He would know where cockpit keys are kept. He would know how strong a cockpit door was if he needed to kick it in, all of those things, because he's a hostage rescue specialist. And an anti... Too bad he wasn't on board (laughs) MH370. He may have been. (laughs) We don't don't know what happened to that plane, do we? We don't. It's a similar story than what happened to this one. Because, you see, when the flight termination system takes over an aircraft remotely which they did uh, on all four aircraft, they lose, it operates on the same frequency as the airplane's transponder. The transponder tells the air traffic controller your altitude, the airline you are, the type of aircraft you are, your speed, and things like that. So the minute the flight termination system takes over, boom, you disappear from radar. And they did. So they could have landed them anywhere. And they did. They landed them. Didn't they land in Cleveland, one of them? No, they all went to one Air Force base in the Western. Air Force base. Mm-hmm. Okay, so all four planes went into a hangar, so they weren't visible. They had hangars that that facilitate C five transport planes, which are bigger oh, okay. than. Oh, uh, They can all go in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They have six of them though, so they could each have their own. All these people that were then executed somehow. I, I believe they were, and now after Methodical Illusion came out, oh, uh, hordes of pilots and flight attendants have come on and said, you have figured this out. This is exactly what happened. And what we think collectively, and we mm. can only guess, yeah. is that the handlers on board, because there were not hijackers, but there were handlers, much like 9B on Flight 11. Sure. And, um, more than likely, they had guns. And that we think they probably told the crew that they were part of one of those ongoing war games going on in testing the NORAD response system. Sure. And once they got them on the ground, the first three aircraft, two people were removed. Flight 11, two flight attendants were removed, and they were taken upstairs, just like Betty Ong said. He stood upstairs. That's where they were, in a hangar. And upstairs in the hangars are office office space. And that's why the, uh, Betty Ong and Amy Sweeney were telling two different stories. They were telling totally opposite details of what was supposedly going on 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 board because they didn't know what what was really supposed to be going on. They didn't know the story. They hadn't been briefed well enough, and they were, you know, nervous and not knowing what what the other one was saying. And again, that was a red flag for me because when you're in a hijacking, the most important thing is all communication is what it is. It's not different. It has to be the same. So if you're giving your location, like you're sitting at your jump seat at 3R, if the uh, uh, hostage rescue people want to come through the back door, they'd want you to move or you're going to have broken knees. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is uh, sad. Some people talked about the planes uh, having been flown out over the Atlantic and, and uh, remotely did, and, and, and crashed into the ocean. But that because you happened. see on a plane crash into the ocean, you just saw this with you air. Have deb- you have debris everywhere. Always, always. And remember your seat bottom cushion is a flotation device. Sure. Always the, I mean, remember Air Asia that crashed the uh, Airbus and uh-huh. the big tail section they pulled up. And then the first thing that popped up were people that were strapped in their seats that came floating to the surface. And that will always happen. So that's just nonsense. That's somebody who doesn't know what happens when you crash an airplane into the ocean. But there was a lot of conspiracy, crazy theories. And listen, when I read them, I was like, oh, my goodness. No wonder airline people stayed away from this because there was so much disinformation, like all the planes flying to Cleveland. And then, listen, you cannot take people that paid good money to go from New York or or Boston to L.A. and then Mm -hmm. take them to Cleveland. And you think you're going to take them in a commercial airport and get them on another airplane to go somewhere else? No. It will meet me on you. I have seen it happen from storm. <laughs> These are simple answers uh, to questions that no one has ever really asked before. They just come up with the answer, and that's yeah. it. <clears throat> Who puts the, the answer out there? 
I couldn't tell you, but I could yeah. guess. Um, well, it's, it's really interesting. What I did was I, I started following s- some of the people for the second book, Methodical Deception, mm-hmm. that made phone calls. And it's amazing what I discovered. And then if we have time, are we, we going to take... Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to go through this break. Go ahead. Okay. If we have time, uh, let me just tell you about this. P- a lot of people ask me about this uh, woman who was on supposedly Flight 77, Barbara Olson. You sure? Now, Barbara Olson, she has yeah. a really interesting background. Her dad was Jewish. I, I can't find any information about her mom, so I just know that her dad was. And he was kind of a um, slumlord in Texas. And she went to a couple years of college down in Texas where she uh-huh. grew up. Uh-huh. Then she went to Hollywood for a decade, you know, liberal Hollywood. She came out as a conservative uh, uh a pundit, I guess you call her. And uh-huh. uh, so she uh, she spends a decade in Hollywood and you can't find any information whether she was acting. She could have been doing commercials, taking acting lessons. We don't know. She worked for HBO and Stacey Keach Productions. Other than that, she could have been anything from an actress to a copy girl. There's just nothing out there uh-huh. about. But she spent 10 years in Hollywood liberal Hollywood, and then she went to a Jewish law school called Yeshiva Law School, and it's I think the name of their law part is Ben Cardova Law School. She goes to law school, and she graduates and goes right to the top of the pig pile in Washington, D.C. She it's joined- amazing how they fast-track their own. Jeez. Yeah, it's amazing. She goes into uh, a law firm called Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering. Now, Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering, they have a really interesting background. Cutler was the White House counsel for Carter and Bill Clinton. I remember him. And part uh, another partner was C. Boyden Gray. C. Boyden Gray was the White House counsel for uh, George H.W. Bush when he was vice president and president. There's wow. another interesting partner at this law firm with Barbara Olson, mm-hmm. Jamie Gorlick, who sat on the commission, 9-11 commission. There was somebody else who's really interesting, and I found that part of the cover-up was through the FBI. But the former FBI director, Robert Mueller, was also a partner in the same law firm as Barbara Olson. Oh, my. This is is wild. How do you sleep at night with all this data? You've got it all. I'm constantly doing research, and it's much deeper than this. We could go on for three hours, I kid you not. So another person. I believe you who's interesting, that was in that same law firm, William Weld. He was the governor at Massachusetts, mm-hmm. and he also was the the coach for George W. Bush for the debates against uh, John Kerry. He was his coach. Huh. I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Barbara Olson, she was right in there with some very interesting connected people to the CIA and the FBI. And so then I go to their client list, and lo and behold, fasten your seatbelt. Jeff Rance, you are never going to believe, in alphabetical order, who's at the top of the list. 9B, remember I told you the name? Yes, yes. Akamai Technologies is a client of Barbara Olson's law firm that she went Uh, to work with. All in the family. Unbelievable. But it gets better going down the alphabetical list. Amdocs. Amdocs was I know about Amdocs. (laughs) <laughs> and they monitored every phone call <clears throat> yeah. in the United States because they were part of billing systems. They do um, the billing, folks, for your cell phone, for your mm-hmm. most probably your landline, but all almost virtually all cell phones, all mobile phones, portable phones, smartphones, smart devices, Amdocs. Well, apparently, there is no company in the United States competent enough to do it, so they have to contract it out to an Israeli company. Amazing, isn't it? Yes. There's another company called Analog Devices, and they work with missile technology and, and drones. And another one, <laughs> AT&T, you know, that's a communication company. But here's the one that really got me, uh-huh. stopped me right in my tracks. Yeah. Avid Technologies. They're a company that specializes in video and audio um, production technology, and they specialize in something that's called digital nonlinear editing. It's mm-hmm. NLE. Now, this is something that's like a cut and paste of live video editing. And a great example of that is since it's NFL season starting up, now, in the last few years, you remember you've seen this, the line of scrimmage shows up as a bright orange line. But if you're in the stadium, you can't see that. That's just that's done through this live editing. And they also put in the teams and the arrows that the Dallas Cowboys are going this way. And, and you don't see that. And the advertisements that they put around the stadium, you don't see those if you're in the stadium. 
They don't exist. They're hmm. put in through using the AVID technologies, mm-hmm. not linear editing system. So I wonder if maybe something like a Tomahawk cruise missile were going toward the South Tower, if this same technology could be used to make it look like a 767. I'm just wondering. I, I'm not sure. But I'm just wondering, and I find it interesting. Another um, interesting... There were supposedly no windows visible on some of those aircraft. That's correct. And the firefighters from the fire boat I've listened to, they're uh, calling into dispatch, and they said it was a military aircraft, like a bomber style yeah. with no yeah. windows, dark green or gray or something. Well, uh-huh. this same law firm also represents Boeing, Citicorp, the uh, Credit Suisse Bank, Deutsche Bank, the HSBC, which everyone knows is just CIA money laundering, and the UBS Bank. And if you've looked into any of the terrorist financing with Scott mm-hmm. Bennett and those things, the UBS Bank is right in there. Mm-hmm. And they also were sitting in a special investigative committee hired by the board of directors for Enron and WorldCom. Good God. So- you remember Enron, <laughs> the evidence for their trial, which was going to trial the next month in October of 2000. Oh, man. In Building 7, the Solomon Building that fell down without yeah. being an aircraft, at 520 that afternoon, all of the evidence lost forever. Doggone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is really something. I talk about all in the family. I mean, the inner connectivity of this is just enough to want to make you puke. These people are thicker than thieves. Thicker it's, than thieves. It is. This isn't even the tip of the iceberg. Oh, I mean, come on, Rebecca. I, this is unbelievable. Four hours today with John B. Wells. <laughs> I think he sliced three of it into a video or a show. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And he... Honest to goodness, he had to get up and take a break. He was sick to his stomach. He felt like, I mean, we went into this so in-depth yeah. that this is nothing. But this is just an example of what I did with everyone that I saw was in a position to make a phone call Got it. or stop the event. And I followed everyone. Now, after Methodical Illusion came out, and I never... You know, mentioned the name of the Air Force Base. I just said it was a reserve base. I had a reserve ba- uh, person contact me mm-hmm. and tell me that she was based there and that they were activated after the second plane hit. And then when they got there, the pl- the base had been evacuated and that they, the entire unit, it was around 2,000 of them, were locked out for two to three days. They were put up in hotels. And she said, until I heard your interview, I had no idea those planes were in our hangars wonder what they did to the people well you know how they love to give you a little hint they hint? probably gassed them yep they use something much more lethal than mace or pepper spray oh yeah and it was quick and i'm we think that the crew were probably told they were part of a drill so when they removed those two people to make the phone calls on the mm-hmm. first jets they mm-hmm. tossed in a canister of something now we train with uh, those things we train with uh, smoke bombs like that for uh, uh simulating a smoke filled cabin in our yearly training mm-hmm. and it wouldn't be until a flight attendant or, or someone mm-hmm. realized that that uh, was cyanide gas or something that they couldn't move. They couldn't. They didn't have the strength to open the door. And if they did, they just fell out. That's kind of what we think. I mean, that's well. We there are not a nerve gases which dissipate fairly quickly. I'm told uh, mm-hmm. they would have had to ev- certainly evacuate that hangar of uh, living people uh, mm-hmm. and then take the bodies out. Easily, to just, they could have tracked a trailer and gotten rid of all of them. How many bodies were there all together? We there figure? was about 260. And mm-hmm. one of the things that um, people ask me is, how, how come the loads were so light? Because each cr- aircraft held around 200, give or yeah. take one. And um, the reason is, is because that there was a group of Israeli spies in this country. Sure. Uh, parading around as art students. Oh, good, uh, the art students, and, yeah. Uh, were um, also connected to a company called NICE, N-I-C-E, all capital letters. Mm -hmm. They are a company that was started from seven veterans from the Signal Intelligence Unit of the Israeli Mossad, Uh and they started NICE, and it's a surveillance company. They actually are surveilling all of Glasgow, Scotland, right now under camera and audio. And so they were a specialist in uh, tapping or tapping phone and computer systems. So 
Now, there's a lots of evidence that the phone lines were tapped for United and American. And so I'm assuming there they also took their made it so that there were very very light loads so they only had 260 people to get rid of. Unreal. It Just is. amazing what you've done. Amazing. Uh stand by we do have to take this break. We'll come right back in another segment to go with Rebecca Roth. This is stunning. You've you've figured it out. You've done it. This is stunning. Back in a minute. Okay, so in all likelihood, they just put the passengers in their planes, gassed them, uh, removed the corpses after they uh, evacuated the nerve gas from the plane, and uh, chucked them out of there, got rid of them. Yeah, well, most of the large bases like that, and that is the second largest base in area in the United States. Uh-huh. Uh, most of them have large incinerators, so it's hard oh, to Oh, they see. burned them up. They probably yeah. did. I'm yeah. going to guess. I mean, they had that base. Those people were locked out for three days. Plenty of time to cremate them all, not cremate, burn them all. These are probably very high-temperature Furnaces they use, not like crematories, which are about 600 degrees. These are probably much more, like 1,000, 1,500. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just guessing, but uh, they would probably have the -the state-of-the-art available to them. This is uh, is is amazing. Yeah. What another thing that I found, uh, you know, when I first looked at this, I I read all the stories and I I kind of fell into that whole emotional thing and. On Flight 175, there were two people that called, and there were two men, passengers. One was a pilot that had flown in the Gulf War. And it's such a small world, Jeff, that his pilot, actually, his pilot's wife, contacted me on email and said, Brian Sweeney was not a pilot. I said, well, that's what the FBI document says. I sent it to her an email. And she said he was a radar uh, uh, radar intercepting officer. Uh-huh, radar so intercept officer, sure. Yeah. He writes in the back seat. I said, oh, really? Well, well, that's interesting that the FBI called him a pilot, and so did his mom. So I just kind of put that around. For some reason, I decided to look into him. And I actually went on his online obituaries, and everybody can find this stuff. I haven't found this. Is not I'm not privy to any magic information. <laughs> Everything I found is just through looking for it. And I found his obituary, and I'm reading and reading, having a cup of coffee, and keep reading down, and all of a sudden... Someone says to him, I remember you, Brian, from the M cafeteria when we both worked at MITRE. Now, MITRE and PTEC were two companies that Andira Singh told us about were working in the FAA headquarters for two years prior to 9-11. God, Coincident- more, this is all Mossad. Uh-huh. Yep. And so here he is. He's sitting at row 31, left-hand side of the aircraft, and I have gotten a terabyte of Freedom of Information Act data where uh-huh. they claim where those planes were. And now it's impossible that he was anywhere near where they claim the plane was, 7,000-foot elevation over the Hudson River, looking off the left side of the aircraft, a beautiful view 7,000 feet above Yeah, yeah. Newark International Airport. And he tells his mother at that moment that they're over Ohio. And I'm thinking, well, how could you be over the Hudson? And if you look out the right side, you're seeing Manhattan skyline and the Statue of Liberty. The other guy that called also was from row 31, but he was on the right side. Instead of seeing the Statue of Liberty at 7,000 foot elevation, mm-hmm. he told his father that for some reason he thought that the hijackers were going to take their plane to Chicago and fly it into a building. Ah, the Sears Tower. Yeah, and so, you know, there was a plane that didn't, for some reason, get hijacked remotely. Something went wrong. But actually, in the Freedom of Information Act data that I have, I found an accident report for Delta Flight 1989. Uh-huh. It did go to Cleveland. It's the only plane that went into Cleveland. And it went there because the FAA told them they had a hijacker on board and a bomb. And the pilot said, no, the flight attendants are serving breakfast. There's nothing wrong here. And they said, you have to land in Cleveland. Well, I think the handlers, something went wrong connecting that plane 
to the remote. To the system. remote. And the yeah, handler, they couldn't take it. I see. Uh, they get the handlers off. What happened to the Delta flight eventually, ultimately? Well, uh, by the time it landed, it was a little after 10 in the morning, uh -huh. you'll remember that the ground stop had taken place, so all the airplanes were forced to land, yes. and nobody could take off. So what happened is everything got grounded at that point. So it landed, and it sat in a remote parking place because the feds kept saying there was a bomb on board, and it sat there for three or four hours. I have that documentation somewhere. Oh, Rebecca, I'm just stunned. Yeah, and then... Um, I, I, when people have, they spun a conspiracy about all these planes going to Cleveland. No, just one did. And if they did use the NASA hangar, there is a big NASA hangar real close to the airport in Cleveland. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They did. It was only because the airport was full of planes. Everybody had to land at the well, near. It was grounded. Everything was grounded. Of course. Grounded. And so the terminal was full. And so if they took them over there, it was only because they needed a place where cabs could come and take them to hotels. Sure. Or could maybe rent cars or, you know, get out of there, figure out what to do. Because at that time, you'll remember, nobody knew what was going on. I mean... It, okay, it, friends, uh, our, our wonderful ally, that, that marvelous little democracy in the Middle East, Israel and its uh, Bolshevik Zionist city of London, Rothschild owners, handlers, came over here, set this up at the behest of I don't know whom, slaughtered over 250 Americans, or thereabout, set this whole thing up, and look what they accomplished from it. This is all part of greater Israel. They destroyed mm -hmm. Iraq. They destroyed Libya. They've uh, beaten the hell out of Afghanistan, which will always be Afghanistan. Now mm -hmm. they're trying to do the same thing to Syria. This is and all about Israel taking charge on behalf of the Rothschild banksters. In London, the city of London, that little two-square-mile area that answers to no one. Mm -hmm. This is about a private storefront business called Israel. This is the Rothschild's private storefront business. This is how they run operations all around the world. God, I'm sick. I, I you, you don't even know a, a 16th of what I've uncovered. And in the second book, Methodical Deception, and so your readers know, if you like autographed books, you, I have three websites where you can find these books and order them autographed, and I'll send them out to you. Oh, yeah, um, yes. Illusion.com, MethodicalDeception.com, yeah, and RebeccaRoth.com. And it's Rebecca spelled the biblical way with a K, R E B. Nice. Yeah, I noticed my webmaster fixed that. Yeah, and and so uh, I I'm, I love doing autograph books. It connects me with the readers, and they share. Oh, it's a very very special thing to do. I'm I'm glad. It's awesome. Well, here's something that happened to me after I did a radio show. Uh -huh. A woman contacted me. Yeah. And she said, "You have vindicated me. Uh, for 14 years, people were saying I was crazy." Uh -huh. And I said, "Well, really? Why? Well, here's her story. This is now in a notarized." affidavit in my safe and mm -hmm. this is her story but this is not her name mm -hmm. but it's in the novel De uh, methodical deception mm -hmm. she said my name is sarah swain and i was living in otis massachusetts on september 11th 2001 mm -hmm. at approximately 8 30 8 35 i saw a united airlines plane fly over my residence at the time and i was so shocked because the plane was so low i could see the people in the windows i was standing on a deck on the second floor and I was watching the plane fly over the top of the house and I lost track of it because of the way the building was but I do think that it was going north when it flew over the house and after I lost sight of it I was speaking with my neighbor and we were just amazed at the height of the plane I it was so low I shouldn't say height I mean altitude it was so low we were flabbergasted now I know that it was approximately 8:30 I would say no later than 8:45 at the latest because I had to go to an appointment in the next town over and be there by 9:30 uh -huh. and I left 5 minutes after I saw the plane and headed to Great Barrington now this town Otis Massachusetts is not the air force base this is due west of Westover Air Force Base in western Massachusetts. I had tracked Flight United 175 mm -hmm. on the, uh, their flight plan mm -hmm. to just south of Westover, and I knew that they had to fly directly over Otis. And when she called wow. me, it's all confirmed. This is not a conspiracy. Every pilot and flight attendant that's read these books and yeah. 
my interviews has said, this is it. Now I have a woman who's willing to go to court. The affidavit signed and notarized. You be careful, uh, young lady. Very <laughs> careful. I mean, it's thank God you've gotten this out. It's out. You're safe. If you can get the information out, that gives you a measure of safety. And yeah, I was very cautious with the first book. I, yeah. Nobody knew about it. I even had to self-edit it. I couldn't trust anybody. Oh, good for you. You, you, know? Used, you know, you did it right. You did it right. All that extra work was worth it. Well, you know, you see people like Andrew Breitbart and Michael Hastings. Oh, they, they kill them. Right? They kill people all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. They tried to kill me April 24th. Uh, oh, they, they shut my brain off at 65 miles an hour. It, just an energy weapon. And uh, the car went off the highway into a ditch, flipped, rolled, spun, did the whole thing. And uh, brain I had brain injuries and, and a broken wrist and hand and... I was very lucky. I survived it. And the firefighters said that was a non-survivable wreck. You should not have survived that. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, they do. They, Andrew they, they Breitbart the, and Michael, they, they, they killed them. Yeah. I have found the weapons. I found patents. I mean, I'm digging into this still. I've got another book or two. Uh, it's, it's science fiction. People can't even comprehend what was used on Well, I hope to God you don't end up putting me in one of your books, but uh, these, these murders need to be covered. Uh, they do. These are very important people playing a very serious role in a deadly business, the truth. Mm-hmm. And they paid the ultimate price. And uh, I, How long have the remote control devices been standard equipment on most Boeing airliners? Uh, these uh, flight termination system things were sold in the early 90s to us, but you know the f- the uh, termina- the uh, technology was available since the 70s. Okay, folks, I want you to please remember that too. That's very important. Rebecca, would you come back? Uh, I don't know if do I have your phone number? I think you do. Um, and don't give it to me on the air. Um, connect it on Skype, but I can text it to your guy. Yeah, text it to uh, the network, and I want to uh, call you and arrange for another visit. Okay, sounds uh, great. And I'll I, get those books off to you real quick. As you're, soon as you're talking to probably the most intelligent audience in talk radio. These are wonderfully informed people, and you have just brought an awful lot of friends into your circle. Oh, uh, thank you. You made a lot of friends. It's thank imp- you. It's truth comes out. We need to yeah. wake people up to who's the real enemy. Well, I, we'll have you back, and we'll talk about the new book, Methodical Deception. And uh, I think I can do that in another week, week and a half. But uh, you take care of yourself, and thank you more I than I can thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay, Rebecca. Good night. Good night. Wow. There it is. There it is. Right there in front of you. That's what happened. Our friend, Israel. No wonder they hate me. I got another big smear piece out on me. Uh, sticks and stones, words can never hurt me. How's it go? You remember. But there are worse things than sticks and stones they can use. That's unfortunate. All right. That's, uh, that's a remarkable, remarkable interview. Both of them. Uh, we'll have Rebecca back as soon as I can arrange it. Thank you for being here. Uh, It is a weekend. I hope you have a good weekend. Take care of yourselves, and we will talk very soon. Okay, here we are back. It's Tuesday already. That means tomorrow is Wednesday. Rebecca Roth joins us tonight in our part two conversation. She has been, well... Busy is an understatement. She's been all over the radio. She more or less burst onto the scene with a book, which has now been followed by a sequel. The first book, Methodical Illusion, and the second book, Methodical Deception. Now, you can get both books autographed by Rebecca Roth if you just simply click on her name and go to her website or remember Methodical Illusion. Dot com. That's methodicalillusion.com. She has an amazing story. It's almost as if she got into the secret files of the perpetrators of 9 11 
but she did a lot of figuring on her own. And it's a story that you can hear in the archives from her first visit back on the 11th of September. It was so overwhelming, I asked her if she could be available to come back. Uh, Rebecca, welcome. How many radio programs do you think you've done since you started? Oh, man, a lot. I don't know, 50, 100? <laughs> yeah, who's counting, right? It's just... I've never listened to them. I, I can't even keep up with like posting them. I, every once in a while, I try to get them out to Facebook or, you know, or link yeah. onto my website. But it's just been very, very crazy. And, you know, um, after our after I visited with you on air, we chatted on the phone. Uh, I still am doing this crazy research, so uh, well, I don't sleep very much anyway. So this just got to be so fascinating. You know, when I started to listen, I was just like everyone else. I was not a truther. I was not a conspiracy theorist. I still am not. Uh -huh. I pay attention to what's going on, but... I've called myself the accidental truther. I mean, I just thought it was what the government said. I retired from flying in 2004 after nearly a 30-year career as an yeah. international truther. And I didn't, until I found the hijackers, a bunch of them were still alive. I, I just, I woke up and I went in and I thought, oh my God, that means what we were shown on TV didn't really happen. What did happen? That was, so I, that, that was the one event that really got you turned around and, and into the direction of doing research. The fact that that's been known for a long time that uh, the majority of them are nearly so were still alive. Oh that's, yeah. That's, the, that's been around, as you know was written September 23rd, 2001. And when I found it, I'm going to guess it was sometime in 2008 when I decided to write a novel and uh -huh. start doing some research. And I thought to myself, how in the hell did I miss this? I mean, I was glued to the television. I was yeah. in the airline industry. We were, I mean, this definitely affected my career and my daily life as a flight attendant. And so I was just shocked. I, I, I couldn't believe it. And I thought, well, you know, I read an article that the Saudi government was actually suing or threatening to sue. Mm -hmm. I never could find a lawsuit filed. Uh, the uh, FBI and the United States government for stealing the identity of uh, half a dozen or so of their citizens. Uh -huh. And I, <laughs> I was shocked that I'd missed it. I thought, well, how in the world did I ever miss that? But I did miss it because I was just like everyone else. I was getting my information from the media. And I, I mean, listen, I was glued to the television for the first 10 days to two weeks. Sure. I got, I was home. So I was like, how in the world? I couldn't understand at the time, how did a, a terrorist or some organization get control of NORAD? That was my big, that was my big hurdle. And how did they get What's those the connection? Now, that's a huge connection. Uh, and to actually have NORAD comply, so to speak with the needs of the time of that day uh, is is phenomenal <laughs> to put it well, mildly and and yeah. here but here you are and the reason I called you afterward to find out if you'd come back on the program was because there are so many people who have put so much of their lives into studying 911 but they never got off the ground they never got to where you were and and as you know that has raised questions well how did she do this <laughs> Who does she know? Who's behind her? She came out of nowhere. You know, the, the same old stuff. And, uh, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I, like I said, I wasn't a conspiracy theorist. I wasn't a quote-unquote truther. Uh, I was a flight attendant. I was an airline professional uh, uh -huh. for nearly 30 years. And uh, I didn't even look at this whole thing until I discovered the hijackers were still alive. And that just told me that what we were shown on television didn't work. And you have to remember, and as part of my uh, training, now I have a unique kind of training because we get trained every year. Sure. We get hijacked protocols and what to do, what to say, what not to do. And so when I was watching all of that unfold, I, I saw things really going sideways, not correct. They weren't following protocol. Cell phones don't work at altitude. And these were things that I knew. And I, I code words were not used. The pilots weren't uh, put using the hijack code. The flight attendants weren't following protocol. They're calling their parents or their spouse. I'm like, uh -huh. that is right. And uh -huh. So I saw uh -huh. things. But I just really, since I was flying till 2004, I, I, I couldn't look at that. I mean, there's just no way you can go do that job and know what I know right now. How was I, it I, for you flying after 2011? And when this stuff started to become clear to you, 
How'd you after, feel about flying? After 9-11, 2001? Yeah. Um, well, first off, it was really chaotic because the government quickly, as quickly as they, as they could, wanted to make it look like to the, to the people, the traveling public, that we had all this security. So they hired college kids. Mm-hmm. And they hired people with no security background, and they set up tables. You might remember this. I mean, anybody that flew during that time will remember this. They put up, like, tables you would buy at Costco or put up for a picnic or, you mm-hmm. know, uh, mm-hmm. your That's office. A, yeah. um, a Six-foot four- banquet, folding uh, banquet table, they call them. Uh, and they would go through all of our things, the flight crew. Uh-huh. and. They would show the passengers, we're, we're so serious about this, look at what we're doing to the flight crew. But yet they wouldn't go through... And these are uh, untrained college kids? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then they hired them. Uh, at first we had a security, it was all college kids uh, mm-hmm. or kids off the street. I don't know where they got them, but young kids. And they would go through and check the seat back pockets, you know, the, in front of you where the magazines sure. are. Stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were supposed to go through and check everything and make sure that there was nothing left on board once the airplane landed before we boarded again. Mm-hmm. Well, we would get on and do the same thing, and we found all kinds, CD players, radios, you name it. I mean, they weren't any good. But they they were scrambling to make it look to the traveling public. Well, okay, that raises the, the question then. Were these ringers, were they hired uh, to look and act like they were doing a good job? When in point of fact, you just mentioned and made it clear that they weren't. They weren't doing their job. And I would yeah. think that after 9-11, they would take it seriously. You would think so. But, you know, one of the things I put in, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't mailed you your books yet because I, I can't. Well, it's okay. Can't You're a little, just a little busy. I understand. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, yes, and I, I used a friend's boutique publishing company. I'm not self-published, but, you know, kind of. A friend had done this, and I said, please do let me do autograph books. And I, I, I swore only 20 people will buy this book. <laughs> we sent, I mean, I can't tell you, we're sending out hundreds every day. Well, congratulations. Then, that's, that's good. No matter what, that's wonderful that people care enough to buy this book and actually do the reading. That's, it's, uh, that's, it, that's it's, encouraging. What's happening, and I, you know, my goal and my mission was not to address people who had been doing this for decades, although I have had lots of email from people that said, man, I've been looking at this since the day it started, and you have opened my eyes to a whole new horizon. Mm-hmm. Because I'm bringing inside uh, perspective, mm-hmm. and so I looked at it and I heard what the flight attendants and the passengers were saying with a flight attendant ear. And so that's something you can't, <laughs> I can't give you, <laughs> I wish, but... Um, I, you know, it's just something I, I know the training. I know what we should have done. Right. I have also been contacted by numerous United and American flight attendants and pilots. As a matter of fact, in the second edition of Methodical Illusion, um, I had it edited better and uh, I had a new forward put in. And it's an actual forward written by a United uh, Boeing 767 captain. Uh-huh. And one of the endorsements is by uh, a retired American Airlines 67 captain. He also flew the 5-7. Both of those planes were involved on 9-11. So. Right. That's very it, nice. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I they, come through. What, what, and, and, I, I'm curious. What, what, what do the other professionals in your industry say about your work? Now, these two obviously found it uh, overwhelming. Uh, but what's the general reaction? Do people say, ah... Well, maybe. Let's are saying you found the missing piece of the puzzle. You put it right on the cover of Methodical uh-huh. Illusion, and you uh, are right on. That's exactly how it happened, and very, very, very supportive. I, I have hundreds of pilots and flight attendants and uh, pursers that are coming forward. They are people who knew the crew members. They knew the protocol. Um, hundreds of them, and they're they were, also they were directly of- related. No, they knew yeah. the they knew the crew, they knew the people. Now, okay, this is fascinating. And and when you were on last time, I was just sitting listening, uh, almost with my jaw hanging open at what you were saying. Now, I've been studying this for a long time. I've had hundreds of guests on talking about this, and here you come along and you reveal what appears to be the truth, and it's been laying around. But no one was ever able to put their hands on it. And did you feel, don't, this isn't cornball stuff, did you feel like you were 
impelled to do this, almost like there was something else pushing you? Or was it just your own natural inquisitiveness and your professional background? Uh, well, when I first discovered some of the hijackers still alive, I, I knew that something was very much amiss with the official story. And the Barbara and Olson, Olson phone call. Oh, yeah, all of the phone calls. Because cell phones don't work. Uh, and they still don't work English on a specially equipped aircraft. Uh, in 2001, there's no way you could be making a phone call. Flight 93, almost all of the calls, according to the U.S. government. Now, uh -huh. I have to tell you, I had to weed through, wade through uh, a lot of what George Bush said, wild conspiracy theories, things that were written by people that had no knowledge of of how a flight attendant works, or how we correspond with the pilots, what our protocols are, nothing. And so they created these wild theories uh, one of which was like the planes were all flown to Cleveland. Well, I know better because I flew out of Boston first, and uh, it's a two-hour flight to Cleveland. <laughs> so we didn't have enough time for those phone calls to be made, and you can't be flying to Cleveland at altitude and be on a phone for a half an hour, right. which the flight attendants on Flight 11 were. So as I started to dissect through this, I, I just... I just zeroed in on as much government data as I could. So I, I, I used uh, all of the FBI documents. And these are uh, documents that have been put into court twice. Well, I don't know if you could call the 9-11 Commission court, but it was similar. And yeah. then the Zachariah Masawi trial, the 20th hijacker, mm -hmm. most of the stuff was then put into his. And that was a court of law. So um, I tried to... Well, when I would see things that were just crazy, like the flight attendants were in on it. Oh, well, I'm here to tell you, I know lots of their co-workers, and they're dead. They weren't in on it. They're not basking in the sun somewhere. Uh, and very offensive. I mean, that's very offensive to uh, me as an airplane well, person. Well, I'm sure it is. It's, it's, it caused you uh, to be almost grief-stricken to hear that kind of crap. It's not Well, yeah. One of the reasons I chose to write the books as a novel was to bring you – the reader, into uh, the life of a flight attendant and how we're all connected. I mean, I got a phone call from an, uh, Qantas from Australia, Qantas mm -hmm. flight attendant the other day, mm -hmm. and we're all one big family. So it doesn't matter if I'm working for the airlines affected or just in an airline employee, and that is worldwide. And huh. here's the thing. We all look alike. If I were to get on a plane today and uh -huh. walk, walk down the aisle, you would ask me for a Coke <laughs> or a blanket or something. I mean, it doesn't matter how... All flight attendants just have that look, and we uh, get on an airplane again. We're always asked to go back to work, even in our retirement. So it's oh, kind of an interesting yeah. family thing, and I don't know. We just have that look of a flight attendant, I guess. But it's very interesting. I've, the support has been incredible. The pilots you were asking about, most of them are buying the book direct from the publisher by cases of 24 at a time and handing them wow. out. Wow. What, so what an incredible endorsement for you. That's yeah. just amazing. It's, uh, well, it's really interesting because we are a special, uh, and firefighters kind of have this too. So I you were asking. loud and clear. I, I yeah. got you. Yeah. It's a special camaraderie, and it's just, it's sort mm -hmm. of a, a whole airline thing. But you were asking me, you know, I wrote this book two years. It sat on a shelf, and I printed it out in a manuscript. And this last year, one year ago, on September 11th, it was about the 6th, I had a two hour conversation with a, retire, a retired New York firefighter. And in that call, uh, it touched me so much because he told me that the firefighters' bodies that they found, most of them were completely disintegrated. Now, that takes a lot of heat and a lot of pressure to do that, to, to disintegrate. So, something was very wrong there, yes. Very wrong. And I literally, I was so touched by that. I got off the phone. I told my husband, you know that book I wrote that's sitting on the shelf? I'm pulling that flash drive out, and we're editing it and putting it out, and... Um, the truth has got to come forward. And so I dedicated that book to the, not just the crews of the airlines, but also the 343 firefighters that gave their lives, doing what they love, but still. Um, and I was just very touched by it. And at that time, I honestly thought that was November 20, 2014. And at the time, I honestly thought maybe two dozen people would ever read it. What I didn't know was everyone was waiting for someone from the airline to talk about this. You were the first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you were the first. And <laughs> somehow, some way, uh, this got done. Uh, some people have grumbled it's in a novel form. I mean, does it really matter? It the does information, matter. The information is there. Um, the of truth, that's what I say. I mean, it, you'll see it. And what 
the beauty of it is, and Jeff has said, it wakes people up. And hundreds of thousands of people have contacted me and said, I always thought there was something wrong. I never saw a plane crash at Shanksville or at the Pentagon. I always thought we were being lied to. And the, I mean, oh my goodness, the, the crowd is growing immense. And um, I, I think that we've been shown by Brian Williams and the likes of Bill O'Reilly, those people on television, they've proven to us they've been lying. And so, of course, you know, they were oh, lying they're, they're, about that. They're not- they are just, yes, they're yes. disgusting. And they see that, unfortunately, they're not the only two. The media is now controlled and run by the enemy of the republic, the enemy of the people, the enemy of the Constitution. Those Ken and Barbie cutouts, those cookie cutter cutouts, are, are perfectly capable of lying at any time. It's all about ego for them, money, fame, fortune. They're, they're really rather disgusting people. And I was 12 years a television news anchorman and news director, and I got out. I walked when I saw where it was going. And I started this program 23 years ago because I knew people who were listening were listening. They weren't just reacting. They were mm-hmm. thinking and processing, and that was crucial for me. So I hear you. Yeah, one of the things that I cover in the second book is I wanted to find out some of the relationships to the people that I, quite frankly, as a flight attendant, thought should have lost their jobs. And where did they go? And what did they follow up? And I also got uh, kind of uh, into an educating uh, uh, mode where I want the reader to understand what the CIA's relationship with with the media is and how, yeah. what, why the yeah. programming. So there's a section in there that talks about how controlled it all is. And it's controlled by, I like to say, by the people who perpetrated 9-11. And that's what I found. Now, listen, when I went into this, I, I mean, I've been called names, so here's the deal. I went into this thinking it was 19 radical uh, Islamic terrorists because that's what I was told over and over and over again. In other words, now I'm out of the matrix, and now I can see I was brainwashed to believe that. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just mortified. This morning I got the most heart-touching email from a, a Saudi Arabian American and who thanked me for speaking the truth that uh, there weren't 19 Arabs on those flights at all. The the real passenger manifest is not available to the public. What the FBI put out was a total lie. Some of the people might be there, but there weren't those 19 Arabs. And when I discovered that, mm-hmm. oh, here's another thing. A flight attendant purser from American Airlines contacted me after Methodical Illusion came out. I mean, the contacts I've had have just been in, in, tremendous. She was in Tokyo, uh, stuck with a United crew at the same hotel. So every day they were getting uh, briefings, and Uh she said they came in and announced the ringleader of this whole terrorist attack was a man named Mohammed Atta. Mm -hmm. She said that American flight attendants about had a heart attack. He was an executive platinum million-mile passenger on American Airlines. Okay, stop, stop, stop. This, people, you've got to hear this. When, When she told me this, I was amazed. Muhammad Atta was almost a legendary flyer. Mm-hmm. Tell us more. Well, let me just kind of tell you from an insider's track, because I know that um, people really uh, clamor for this inside knowledge. So let me just tell you this, because I flew uh, international quite a lot, most of, yeah. most of my career. And if I were in, let's just say, Los Angeles, and I saw one of our million-mile customers, uh-huh. I would know by face and by name, first and last. And if I saw him in a magazine rack or at, in a, you know, the bar or in a restaurant sitting, you know, and I'm maybe on the way to the plane, I was like, hey, Jeff, how are you doing? Are you going to Tokyo with us today uh-huh, on uh-huh. flight and such? And that's how well you know these people. You know what they drink. You know if they like to eat or sleep or, you know, they only want the breakfast before landing kind of thing. And so we know them really, really well. She told me, and she was about a 30-year uh, flight attendant as well, and she just told me that all of the flight attendants there mostly were senior enough to hold international, and so they were 20- to 30-year people. So that means if you're flying domestic, which we do sometimes, uh, yeah. even the international people, we fly domestic trips for whatever reason. Sometimes we just want to bump up our hours or pick up an extra trip or just make an adjustment on our schedule, and we can fly domestic and international. Well, so if you're flying uh, domestic, and let's say you're going from Boston to Los Angeles, and Mr. Atta is on board, you would know him, and you would be the first class. Uh, usually the most senior person is first class. So um, all so of he, the he, he did fly first class all the time. 
business, yeah, on first class. See, if you're a uh, executive platinum, you get uh, free upgrades. Got it. <laughs> okay. All right. Stand by, Rebecca, just for a couple. I'll take a little break. We'll come right back. Talking with Rebecca Roth, just uh, a, a stunning breakthrough in the whole 9 11 story. Back in a minute. Okay, and we're back. Uh, grateful to have Rebecca Roth back with us again. She is a very friendly person, as you might expect from her career, as a uh, friendly person working as a purser and flight attendant on uh, national and international flights. The idea of a fraternity, sorority, uh, a family is very interesting, what you must have heard from other people. Have you heard anything from other stewardesses and pilots which have sharpened your research, opened other no doors or, or areas to explore? Uh, no, I don't think so, other than the fact that Mohammed Atta was a million-mile passenger, because, you know, that according You to didn't the know that in the beginning? That came later? Uh, uh, after Methodical Illusion came out, I uh, was given that information by a flight attendant. Uh-huh. Uh, that, you know, that gal that was stuck in Tokyo, she was, uh, they, everybody was so amazed. Because here's the thing. Remember the official story of 9-11? that Mohammed Atta had gone to Portland, Maine, and he came back to Boston, which is like 15 minutes to spare. I mean, he had a really tight connection, uh -huh. maybe 20 minutes. You'll remember this part of the story, and, and the FBI told us that Mohammed Atta had rented a car, and then he uh, rented another car and left one of them at the Boston uh, parking with, with lot. With the Koran in, in the back. Yeah, and not only that, but when he made that tight connection, because he flew back in from, and that's where they claim they have him on security tape, but you can't tell who he really is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so so here's the thing. If he's a, a, a platinum, executive platinum, million-mile passenger, as part of that status, you get a luggage tag that uh, guarantees that piece of luggage will be put on your flight, period. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, but you'll remember his huh. luggage didn't make a flight, and that's how... Someone down there on the ramp, right? American found his luggage with his will, testament, and manuals for flying airplanes and Korans and all that stuff. Uh, some of it they found in his car, but they also found his luggage that didn't make the connect. That is, my friend, impossible for an executive million mile passenger because you get like a brass luggage tag and we know what it looks like. So if we see it, we know you're one of them. And it doesn't matter where we see that. Even you though, you, even though you don't, tell. you don't handle the luggage you see it on the luggage so you know That's, yeah so if you, if you were on a in a bus a shuttle bus going to you know the the hyatt regency with us and i looked uh -huh. down and saw that luggage tag i would mm -hmm. know you were a million mile customer with mm -hmm. us so mm -hmm. i mean it's not, and everyone in the airline knows it especially the luggage baggage handlers and stuff so we are led to believe again by the official story and the thing i found interesting is the official story has the side story about him and his luggage not making the flight, which is impossible for him now mm -hmm. that we know he's a million mile passenger. But also his father was contacted by a, a reporter from the, I can't remember now, if it's the Telegraph, one of the newspapers out of the UK on the 12th of September. And because by then they were, you know, spouting his name around the world mm -hmm. and his said, well, no, he had talked to his son on the 12th earlier that day, and he was happy and fine, everything was great. And they asked him where he could, you know, can we find him? Do you know where he's at? And he said, if you want to know where my, my son is, you'll have to ask the Mossad, because that's who he works for. And when I found that, I was oh, like, oh. very interesting. Uh -huh. Another connection that I found, and you know, like I said, you know, I dove into this thinking I was going to find 19 radical Muslims, but what I found was something totally different. Yeah, well, some of those people were, uh, as I believe, uh, very accomplished professionals in different fields. They weren't flakes. Um, it's been a while since I remember reading about them. There, some of them, if not most of them, maybe even all of them, are still alive. No? <laughs> well, you know, I found 10 of them are still alive, and then uh -huh. I've... Uh, I've read so some people from the intelligence world think that uh, just like I was going to do when I Google searched their names, uh, 
I was going to create a character for a novel, completely uh, fictional. <laughs> right. And so they may not even have been. And if you look at the list of the names of the supposed 19 hijackers, a lot of them, like two or three of them, all have the same last name. Ah. Uh-huh. Coincid- but, you yeah. know, originally the FBI mm-hmm. also, um, of that 19, there, there were four different names originally in the first uh, 72 hours or so. They kind of changed it without making much of a fanfare. Although you can find a, a correction uh, by CNN because CNN reported those other four names. And then they did a withdrawal or, or correction later on. But they didn't make a big deal of Like I said, I didn't know it until I was doing this. But the three of those people they claimed were on the passenger manifest, quote, from the FBI, were still alive and showed up. One of them was an FAA flight instructor. His last, he happened to have an a Islamic or a, a Muslim last name. No or kidding. A, and there was another wow. gentleman claimed was the uh, the fourth one, and he'd been dead for a year since September 11th, 2000. He mm-hmm. died in a small plane crash outside of, somewhere in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they got kind of busted because three of those guys showed up alive. And, of course, now it's really interesting because that story I told when I was uh, doing my first interviews with Methodical Illusion, and um, there was a guy who was an employee at the FAA, and he's kind of like, you know, office geek kind of guy, mm-hmm. you know, one of those go-getters. And when he heard the names, uh, the list of the names that the television put out, he started running him through the FAA lists and found the uh, Adnan Bukhari was his name as an employee of the FAA. So he went to his supervisor and he told his supervisor, wait, 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 he's one of us. He's, he's an employee. He's a flight safety instructor down in at a Saratoga Springs, someplace in Florida. Right. And I just don't remember the, the town. It doesn't really matter. And, uh, he got fired. That guy, the office guy, got fired for pointing this out to his supervisors. And his family contacted me from hearing hmm. a Coast to Coast or some radio show that I did and hmm. mentioned uh, the, that one of these guys was an FAA employee. And he found actually been found out about. And when that guy turned, it, turned in the information that, hey, wait a minute, he's an employee hmm. and he's a flight instructor down in Florida, and he's still alive, and the guy shows up alive, that guy got fired. Okay, so here's what happened to him. He eventually fought and got his job back. It took a, a month or three or something. And stepping off a bus in Washington, D.C., uh-uh. hit black SUV in a hit and run. Yeah. That's the FAA employee that, you know, yeah. did the due diligence looking in the list. Yeah, you know, simple. He thought he was going to find them on the no-fly list, but ah. he didn't. Well, and so he was a go getter. <laughs> yeah, his heart was in the right well, place. Well, too bad. <laughs> uh, he's gone, and uh, he tried, and that's all we can do. You uh, had any threats? Any uh, hassles? No, not not like you had. <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, I've, it's it's been interesting because um, of people that are supposedly in in this truth movement, Mm -hmm. uh, some have been a little bit uh, nasty, or we don't think you ever flew. Well, you know, I have a whole jewelry box of wings, (laughs) a collection over 30 years, a couple hats. Um, But at the same time, since you understand this, because you did have a death uh, experience from them, um, I do keep myself on the move, and I have... uh, set myself up before you see i wrote the book two years before it came published because i really thought i'd be a drone strike uh to when i found out what i did where the planes were taken and how uh-huh, it was done uh-huh. it was being hit, and then i traced all of those connections and then i continued tracing those connections into the second book and um so i had to i set myself up with uh several places to go that are out out of the way I, <laughs> well smart <laughs> these these people are they're not human, really. They're 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 very ugly. Uh, human life means nothing to them, them, uh, and they will kill uh, people without the second thought. Poor guy getting off the bus. Oh. Okay, just a sec. We got to take a two minute break. We'll come right back, Rebecca. Hold on. Okay, welcome back. We're not going to go back and rehash. Rebecca's first interview here, her first conversation, it's, it's in the archives and well worth reading. Maybe I'll put all three of these hours up for the I think I will. So everyone can listen, free listen. We'll put it on the home page. It's, it's just very important for all of you to have a chance to consider what she has put in novel form. Uh, her career, uh, 
over 30 years flying. As she said, she has a box full of wings and so forth. This is, uh, this is something that hasn't deterred criticism, however. There have been some, some very pointed barbs thrown at you. I don't really care to go there, particularly. Is there anything that you want to mention that has been tossed at you that you can just volleyball right back and you like a forum to do it? You've got it right now if you'd like to. Because well, there, there are some folks out there who are, who are pretty mean in the media. And, uh, <laughs> I've ahead. heard that, but I haven't read it or gotten involved. I, I'm so busy. I, you just have, I mean, someone oh, said, I have can an I, idea. I, I, can I, I do. do anything? I said, yeah, 12 more hours in every single day. Because I, I am still digging into this. I still have that terabyte of information, although I've, I've exposed a lot in the second book. The, after the first book, there wasn't, as far as I know, but then I don't hang out on the Internet. I'm not, like, looking to see if somebody bad-talking me. Um, I've got busier things to do than that. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm also a grandmother, so... Uh, I oh, have a well, life. fun. Congratulations. That's nice. I've got, you know, kids to go visit and places to go. And uh, I am very safety conscious, so I don't uh, share a lot of my personal stuff. I just am not involved. I know that people have said said to me so-and-so saying such and such, and I said, you know, I just don't have time. Uh, it's a long time ago was I in junior You know, there's, a, there's an organization, you talk about Mossad. Uh, it's one of the major, and there are over 50 major Jewish activist Zionist organizations in this country who are not good Jewish people, in my opinion, who have written about me for, for years off and on. And it's I had to make a decision, a choice early on. Do I go down in the gutter into the cesspool and throw stuff with these people back at them? Or do I just forget it and concentrate on what I can do to the best of my ability to do what I do? And I, I decided no way am I going to get pulled down, and tricked. That's an old trick. They love to defame. They love to libel people. It's, it's what they do. They're hate. They're the true hate merchants. It's not me. It's not you <laughs> folks out there. It's them. It Just read the garbage they've written about me. It's all <laughs> bullshit. It's lies. It's corruption. It's the lie of omission. It's half truth, quarter truth. It's zero truth. It doesn't matter. They're professionals at this. That's what they. That's what they get paid for. That's the Saul Alinsky rules for radical uh, response, uh, and you see it everywhere. Glenn Beck did it. Uh, by, I think he coined the phrase "truther." Uh, oh, Bill O'Reilly calls people pinheads. Everyone, this name calling. Right. Um, right. You know, I, I don't. I don't have to prove to you or anyone else who I am, where I've been, or where I live, or what my bra size is. So I just said, oh, listen, I'm 65 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been there. I, junior high was a long time ago. I just cannot get diverted. Some of these people I know by name have uh, been very divisive and um, in the truth movement, and I actually addressed that in the second book. Oh, and good. I believe, well, quite frankly, that I don't use anybody's name, but just the fact that there are dividers and and the one truth of the movement is shot full of people who are agents. They're working yeah, exactly. for the enemy. They were infiltrated from the day one because they knew people would start to wake up eventually. And and I often. I often compare what happened to all of us. And trust me, I was there. Um, until I saw that those hijackers were still alive, I was in that matrix. I was fooled by the media. I was mm -hmm. under their spell. And so it's like the men in black with that little, um, you know, atomizer, they, that little light they, they make people. Yeah, flash. And I think that happened to us when we saw the Pentagon hit or when we saw those people jumping from the towers. Oh, terribly some, powerful uh, images for people. Yes, and, and yeah. yeah they, they uh, programmed that over and over and over and over again. And so I think what's happening is people are waking up by the hordes and they're realizing that uh, something's very wrong with this country. And the people that have melded and molded this country that own Hollywood and the networks and control all the news yes. are the same people that have destroyed uh, and brought things in, in that are not normal into our uh, our, our uh, prime time TV viewing, for example. So <laughs> absolutely, well, we can call it <laughs> we can call it Satanism, we can call it evil, we can call it whatever you want. But there is a clear direction that the entertainment media has taken the mass of the sheeple, the people, 
who don't know any better and who don't really have the ability to stand back and stop reacting to things. They're not proactive anymore. And they have been taken to a place of near virtual control. Uh, this is not a game. It's not a joke. They're very, very good at this. It's, it's a science to them, and it's a piece of cake. Oh, definitely. And and that's one of the things I really wanted to bring out in the, the second book. The first book, I wanted you to see what happens when there's an event like 9-11, a crash or anything. And there's a couple fictitious uh, events, but I wanted people to understand how it affect how it affects all flight attendants and pilots across the board and how we are united. And that's why I'm not being attacked by one single solitary uh, airline person that I'm aware of. Mm-hmm. I, and I, I know that there's someone that runs a blog that said I was just trying to make money off of a book. Well, I think, have you ever written a book? There is no money in it. No. <laughs> so I'm putting my life on the line for $3 a copy or $2 <laughs> a book. I mean, it's hardly worth it. because No, I have- no, no authors make money. Very, very few. And so, I mean, it's just nonsensical when I hear things like that. It's just really crazy. But for the second book, what I used was DEA documents, FBI, mm-hmm. FAA, NORAD, the United States Air Force, the National Transportation were these, Safety- pu- were these public released documents you just went through and uh, called yes. more information from? Yes. Gluing things together, connecting things? I'm a connector. You know, I, I think I told you this when we were talking on the phone. I studied organic chemistry and biochemistry in school. So hmm. you have to go into things on a molecular level. When you add molecules and you've got electrons and they're going to e- either repel each other or <laughs> really like each other and become something else, you are, have that ability. And I think looking back now, that is one of the things that's helped me to dissect this a uh, whole thing and connect all the dots, put all the pieces of the puzzle together, and um, also in the, from the the stuff from the Zachariah Masawi trial because uh, it's been really interesting to see how the FBI changed documents. For example, in the Zachariah Masawi trial, they never mentioned Barbara Olson's phone calls. Really, they didn't exist, and I found that really. Oh, they interesting. were one of the early highlights of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, and this is one of the things I did for my second book was I. I started following up each person that made the phone calls that that were made so public to us. Uh huh. Um, and lo and behold, if I didn't connect most of them back to one source, I bet you know where that is. You're kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I don't remember if we that's talked amazing about Barbara Olson on the air last time or not, but because I've just done so many interviews, but. I was so fascinated by the fact that she graduated from a two-year college in Texas, and then she went to Hollywood and went to work for HBO, which is kind of like saying you went to work for the CIA. And Hollywood, like we were just talking, is infiltrated with CIA, Mossad, um, lots of Jewish people, obviously. And she was actually from a Jewish family. So uh, her maiden name was Jewish. And I didn't know that until I was looking in and just reading stuff about her. She spent a decade in liberal Hollywood and came out somehow a conservative. But in between coming to Washington, D.C. as a conservative, she went to Yeshiva Law School, and a Jewish school, which is very liberal also. Uh And she came out of there. She married uh, Ted Olson, and Ted Olson was the attorney for the Israeli Mossad spy, Jonathan Pollard, who's still in prison. And I didn't know this. I was like, wow, that's really wild. But she got an amazing story. Amazing. yeah, she got out of this uh, law s- or her school and immediately went. I say that to the top of the pig pile in Washington D.C. That's she what went- they do. They they fast yeah. track their own every time. And she went- she went to work for Wilmer Cutler and Pickering. And mm-hmm. uh, anybody can look this up. I mean, you can read their Wikipedia, click on their on their homepage, and you can see all this too. I mean, this is I'm not. Uh, I mean, I studied chemistry, but I'm not a rocket scientist. Okay, I mean, I just know how to look. Got and it. um. That uh, uh, law firm, you know, that pro- they produced the White House counsel for uh, Carter and Bill Clinton. Also, C. Boyden Gray was with uh, Vice President George H.W. Bush, and then again when he was president. Another name people will remember from the 9-11 Commission as a member, J- Jamie Gorlick. Mm-hmm. Uh, so another person, and I kept finding... Now, Gorlick is uh, a billionaire. <laughs> I also kept finding things that the FBI was deleting and covering up very important information for cracking uh-huh. this case, like uh-huh. I did. Uh-huh. Uh, Robert Robert Mueller was also a partner at that law firm, and I thought, wow. well, that, I mean, what are the chances? And then William Weldon, family, wow, yeah, 
was also um, William Weld was the governor of Massachusetts, uh, you know, shortly before that. But uh, what really tripped me up was going through the uh, this is Wilmer Cutler and Pickering's client list, and at the top of that list was the company that was owned by the gentleman seated in nine B, the highly trained Sayeret Metcal Israeli Dan- defense Dan- force. Daniel. Daniel Lewin. His company called Akamai Technologies uh-huh. was client and so the next one in alphabetical order was amdocs another israeli company i know I've, think- I've spent so much time telling people about amdocs and 95 percent of our phone bills are generated by amdocs they they know everything that we know about who we talk to when we talk to them it's it's, it's oh, crazy and i did a little research on amdocs they had for a decade prior to 9-11 been monitoring every phone call we make uh, yeah, i know the- I know. And so I'm like, well, why did they miss the 19 Arabs? Well, what about that? You know, so you have to, you can only believe part of the story, but they're also, their clients are lots of banks like Goldman Sachs, UBS, HSBC, Deutsche Bank. You remember they were right down there at Credit Suisse. Also, they uh, represented Enron and WorldCom. They were in Building 7. All connected, folks. And keep in mind that our, our Zionist, Bolshevik, Marxist friends represent. 0.37% 0.37% of the world population. And here they are at the top of the heap. Everywhere you look, if they don't control it, they influence it. And they are... Uh... There's a great book out, How the Jews Invented Hollywood. If you ever want to read it, Neil Gabler wrote it. He's a Jewish film critic. And uh, it tells you the whole story. We, we are just, as a populace, in the palm of their hands. And they can squeeze anytime they want. It's a, it's really an amazing story. Back in just a minute. Hold on, uh, Rebecca. We'll be continuing in just a few. Thank you. Wonderful first hour. One hour to go. Okay, welcome back. Hour number two with Rebecca Roth, whose new book is out now. You can go to her website anytime at all. Uh, it's very simple to get to. Just remember the words methodical and illusion. Methodicalillusion.com. The new book out, Methodical Deception, you can get both of them. You can get them autographed if you'd like. Just uh, go to the site and order them. It's really that easy. The book has been out, uh, Deception, how long now? Uh, it came out... Um well, the hardback just came out about a week ago. So uh-huh. uh, uh, the Kindle and the softback came out around the 29th or 30th of August. I, I met my goal of September 1st. <laughs> I wanted to have it out by the 1st of September. So I've got it out well, a couple it, days. It takes a lot of discipline to do that. It's not. Uh, my father was a writer, among other things, and uh, he used to call it the loneliest profession. Now we can <laughs> call it the loneliest and worst po- paid profession, I guess, too. It's awful. Uh, it's people. really interesting, but um, and I just I'm I'm driven uh, on behalf of the firefighters and the flight crews and the passengers and all the people in the Middle East that have given their their lives. Uh, well, on this you know, you know how many? Almost six million. Um, I can believe that. Isn't a funny number, huh? But that's yeah. the truth. About three million in Iraq, close to three million uh, Afghanistan and elsewhere. It's just that's... on and on and on. It is truly unbelievable. As I continued looking at that Wilmer Cutler and Pickering, another name popped out, and I bet you'll recognize this one. Besides G.E. Monsanto and Morgan Stanley, the next one in line was Oracle, and that was Todd. Oh Beaver. yeah. Oh, and so yeah. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how can you how can you get any more connected than this? We've got Daniel Lewin. He made a phone call. We got Barbara Olson. This is the law firm she worked for, and yeah. now we've got Todd Beamer's company that he worked for, and there's another company that's really interesting in this, too. Uh, now, besides... remember, folks, who Todd Beamer was. I hope they do. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's roll. He's the let's roll hero. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. There's another company they represent called Allied Materials, and Allied Materials bought a, a company called uh, Varian Semiconductors. They also bought two or uh, three Israeli companies, so they're very connected to Israel. So is Oracle through Larry Ellison. You bet. So, Again, I'm finding the same uh, connection, and so far, almost all of the people that we were led to believe on Flight 93 were heroes, were connected to the military-industrial complex and or Israel or both. 
Wow. Uh, by the way, speaking of Israeli companies like Amdocs, very few people know that the, the ultra above top secret communications equipment from Air Force One uh, to the White House to the Pentagon and back and forth was installed by apparently no American company had the technical knowledge or expertise to do something like that. So they had to go to Israel to get an Israeli company to do it. And you wouldn't think, folks, would you, that they build a back door or two or ten into the system? Uh, there are no secrets to these people. It is often said, tongue-in-cheek, but I'm not sure how much, that the intel gathered by the NSA, etc., goes to Tel Aviv first, recorded, and then is dumped off in Utah. So I don't know the answers to this, but it stinks, all of it, and it always has. Remember, Zionism is a non-religious, a secular geopolitical movement for world domination. It has been in the works for hundreds of years. Nothing new. It's just something that people haven't been aware of. And you're right. They are waking up now. And this is scaring them. I'm sure it is. They don't like well, it. Well, in my first book, Methodical Illusion, I worked something in there. It was something that I'd really actually found. And again, I want to mention this in case I did last time. I want to still mention it again. Sure, go ahead. Reading through a brand new iPad and reading the news to my uh, husband as we were driving on the highway. It was a, I believe it came from a, a, a website called Ynet News out of Israel. Yep. They claimed, and now remember that the Israeli intelligence claimed that they knew 9-11 was going to happen too after it happened. They, they were That's right. right. They did. So this is what struck me because this was about two and a half years ago maybe that I'm reading this. But it to me was a signal that there is, you know, people in the know, kind of like the Odigo text messaging that... Yeah. Is, that told people not to go into the World Trade Center towers. And only about, what, three or four or five Jews went to work that day. The uh, 12 or 1,400 didn't, something like that. I, I heard 4,000 got the text Was message. it 4,000? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so I'm reading this, and here's how the article basically went. The Israeli intelligence had intercepted chatter and plans that the Al-Qaeda, now they've kind of been huh. replaced, was yeah. planning to attack five or six major United States cities using biological, chemical, and nuclear weaponry over a nine-day period. And if that happens here, which it could, because don't forget, they are the only uh, country in the world that has the written out there, you can go find it online, the Samson option to nuclearly attack. It's, it's really important people under, we should, go ahead, but I'm going to come back to the Samson option. That's, mm -hmm. it's, it's critical. Go ahead. And so, um, so the other day I did an interview with someone in the host called me back a couple of days later and said, I have a friend who's kind of in security intelligence, some, you know, in that field. And he contacted me and said, how did that retirement retired flight attendant know what the United States intelligence is monitoring for right now? You heard what I just said. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, can I get an update? Can you get a hold of that guy? I mean, how, what are they thinking? Are they thinking September? Is this uh, going along with the market crash? Is it because you see what the market's doing now? It's doing the same roller coaster. And you know, the American people are so cool. I have gotten someone that contacted me that was watching this roller coaster pre 9 11 as well and contacted me and said, I'm a market watcher. I watch the charts. And mm -hmm. this is doing mm -hmm. the same thing before the last false flag of 9 11. And so I think the only way we right can. Right now. Yes, right now. It's uh -huh. going up right now. It goes up 300 points, down 300 points. And it's like a roller coaster. Yeah. And so what, what this person was telling me is this last X amount of days or weeks that he's been monitoring, he said, I just have to give you a heads up. We are right now on the verge, just exactly where we were pre-9-11. Well, remember about uh, a month or two ago, the chatter began to be heard, if you listen real carefully, that end of September... 24, 26, 27, 23rd, somewhere in that week, and we're in that week right now, something exactly. very major was going to happen. Now, this is very interesting what you're telling me. Yeah, well, I thought it was very interesting that someone in security uh, would have heard that and wanted to know. I mean, yeah. I'm not an agent. I don't care what they say. <laughs> if I am, I busted him in oh. both um, yeah. But I, I, I read about it in an Israeli newspaper. Now, here's the thing that really freaked me out. As soon as I read that to my husband, I went, wait a minute. I was just over on Drudge, and I went back and I checked CNN, ABC, NBC, every news 
and Drudge, because he kind of covers everything, and not one word was said in one American newspaper. They were talking about Kim Kardashian or some nonsense. Uh-huh. And I'm like, this is important news. A biological, a chemical, and a nuclear attack in six of our cities is major news. And not one person was saying it. And I was like, wild. I got home about maybe six or eight hours later, went to my laptop, and I went, went to pull that back up, and it was scrubbed. Oh, and I yeah. told my husband, this was a message to people who know what's coming, just like the Odigo text message was. Don't go. They didn't tell them they were going to blow up the towers. They just said, don't go to work in the towers today. Don't go anywhere near the towers today, I, I suppose. They might have said in their text message to those Jews. Yeah, yeah. Well, they didn't go. You know, I go. guess we, we could maybe sign up for Odigo text services. And find I, think it's, I think it's a good <laughs> idea. Jeez. I mean, I'm just blown away. So that's why I decided I better talk about that because I know you have a pretty good sized audience. And I think the only way we can stop this, because we know this, and we've talked about it earlier, the Israelis monitor social media. And if you are out on social media, you oh. need to be repeating that they have a false flag planned again. They were behind 9-11. And get it out there. Shine that light on those cockroaches so they don't do this. It's our only hope right now. It is possible to stop them if enough people know and begin to talk about it on the social media. That's a very good point. Very important. They definitely monitor. And if you don't believe me, just type in Israel in the search bar on Facebook and or Mossad, and it takes you to a page. And so you tag them whenever you say Israel or Mossad in your conversation on Facebook. It goes right to this so they know who you are. Very smart. The thing that bothers me, Rebecca, is they're so arrogant anymore they they just don't care they own the media you go all the way back to operation northwoods in the 1950s when the cia cia whatever uh and whoever their friends were back then of course we know who their friends are now they're controlling friends they said they could put a, a major story any story they want in any major newspaper in america within minutes if they wanted to that there was a brag they mm-hmm. bragged and that's true now that's in the 50s can you folks imagine the control they have now? How many people you watch on TV? Not necessarily all of them, but how many you watch on TV that are actually employed by the enemy of humanity that are right there in your face and that you learn to trust? My God, it's, uh, it, I got out after 12 years and I, I could see where it was going and it made me sick. I wanted nothing to do with it. The Samson you know, option. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, a lot of people ask me, was this planned in advance? Well, all you have to do is uh, Google search project for New American Century. And if you look at those people, including Jeb Bush as a signer, Dan Quayle signed it, lots of people. Oh, but yeah. if you look at them, all of those people that were signers, these people planned for a quote-unquote new Pearl Harbor that was necessary to rally the sheep behind that red, white, and blue flag and go bomb the hell out of the Middle East. And we've done that for 14 years. Our country's broke, and we're still going in and trying to bomb Syria, and we have our eyes set on, well, we don't, but Israel has their heart set on us going uh, Well, my my man of the year, maybe man of the decade, Vladimir Putin, uh, has said we are not going to allow Syria to fall, and that has really shaken the pentagram. I call it the pentagram. Uh, (laughs) It has shaken those people up. They don't like that. He's, he is a man not to be trifled with yes. at all. He's a very smart man. Uh, and I heard someone on, on a, where was it? So, uh, anyway, saying that he, they wish that he was our president, uh, that Russia in many ways has become what America used to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very interesting. Now, that may be a distorted perception, but that's the kind of thing that's being thought by people. The Samson option for those of you who don't know, is the name that many military analysts and authors have given to Israel's deterrence strategy, i.e. thermonuclear deterrence, of massive retaliation with nuclear weapons as a, quote, last resort <clears throat> if military attacks threaten its existence. In other words, if they feel they're about to be wiped out, they can take out any capital city Basically, in the world, they're that, they're that advanced. They have ICBMs. They have cruise missiles that can be launched from submarines, uh, aircraft. They, they've got it all, thanks to us. Commentators have also employed the term to refer to situations where non-nuclear, non-Israeli actors 
have threatened conventional weapons retaliation. Two examples have been given, Yasser Arafat and Hezbollah. Uh, it goes on. You can look it up, uh, Wikipedia, anywhere. But they have plans, folks, to take... And I've I, I, Rebecca, I said this, I'll bet I said this 20 years ago, if it was yesterday. The controllers will take it all down in flames rather than give up their control. They don't give a damn. They're not going to give up their control. So we're not going to outsmart them, outthink them, outlegislate them. They own it. They own the game now. Now, if we get on that, what she just said, if we make enough noise, we can potentially force them to change their plans, to delay, to stall, to reschedule, whatever. Otherwise, I think most of us know the next 9-11 event is going to be far worse, far more deadly, and Americans will literally come groveling to their, quote, government of career criminal politicians to protect them. Definitely. Okay. Now, um... I want to thank you again for being on the program on 9-11. That, to, to get you on 9-11 was just amazing. You were well, obviously I, very tired, and you were wonderful. So, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was a crazy day. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, but it, it was good, you know. And for me, you know, when I stop and think about it, that's why I don't really worry about people questioning whether I was a flight attendant. All they have to do is read the first three chapters of Methodical Illusion because I teach you how to order a beer and dinner in Japan. And so, I mean, I wouldn't know how to do that <laughs> if I was living um, And not flying, actually. I wouldn't know the protocols. I mean, for me, the difference is, and I realize now, you know, having done quite a few, um, and uh, lots of people contact me on Facebook and email, and, and I share, you know, the inside, how little people knew about uh, my job and it's very mm-hmm. mysterious mm-hmm. and so to be speaking out as a airline professional and see i can do this and people went well how come more people aren't well first off look at the attacks that people have put on me not from the first book but from the second book and in this second book there is no doubt about it in the appendix of this book it will show you anybody who re- reads this is written through a nice sweet novel and the last three chapters will blow your mind and and it, and just to prove to you what, what they're saying is true about 9-11, it's in mm-hmm. the appendix. And mm-hmm. there are stra- screenshots in the appendix from things that I had from the Freedom of Information Act data. Now, after the first book came out, I got uh, contacted with uh, a researcher who had pulled all of this Freedom of Information Act stuff, nearly a terabyte, mostly radar stuff from NORAD and the FAA. So I spent thousands of hours going through that. But I, I had uh, no I just, idea you could do that. That's amazing. Yeah, Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So when I found out this guy had all this, we were sharing all these files on Skype, and I said, could you just give me all of this? I mean, if I, how much, what what does it take? He goes, send me an external hard drive, and I'll load it all up for you. So I did. I went to Amazon. I sent it to him, and I said, well, I don't want you to pay the postage. I'll tell you where I'm at, and you can send it. And this thing arrived on Christmas Eve, and the postage on it was $9.11. And I and in there that this was so much bigger than me and that's why i i just can't be bogged down by the childish junior high behavior some people are questioning you know my religion my race my hair my <laughs> my career whatever right. where i live what i'm doing who i'm sleeping with or whatever i mean it's just weird i'm like i, I just expose such huge stuff and it's in government documents proof in the appendix and yes it's written in a novel hopefully to save me from being a drone strike but at this point i've come to grips with probably being killed so i, I don't really care i mean I'm just not attached to that. I'm not living in any fear at all because I won't let them have that. Um, well, I had to make the second- same decision uh, long yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah, you do. And like you're, the event you went through, uh, I'm just very, very aware. I'm I'm smart. I'm smarter than uh, Andrew Breitbart was. I mean, he went out and bragged Good that he had Lord. The yeah. president. And I'm thinking to myself. Well, Mike, that, the, the journalist, the young man who was also Jesus. killed, yeah, Michael Hastings. Hastings said the same thing. He said, I've got something so big, he, he opened his mouth. And people talk. They love to gossip. And yes. he, he signed his own demise, uh, unfortunately. You've yeah, got to keep your mouth shut. 
And that's what I did. I mean, my husband knew um, because when I discovered where the planes were taken and how it was done and who covered it up and how all that was done, at first I got physically sick. I could not believe it. I tried to debunk myself for a month. I said, please, God, make me be wrong. It really just made me sick to think about what the alternative was to flying into those buildings. But I wasn't wrong. And I wasn't wrong because I went by the phone calls and I knew that those phone calls they claimed were cell phones had to have been made on the ground. And each one of those planes, and I teach the reader how to do that, Uh huh. how wow. to go to a website and do calculate to see the flight time. And mm-hmm. so you could see where those planes were taken remotely. And then after Methodical Illusion came out, while I was writing this one, I, I mean, it, to me, these just miracles are happening. A woman contacted me. Uh, she had heard an interview and she just, she bought the book. She came apart. She sent me an email and said, I just have to talk to you. And she told me that she was an eyewitness and she told me exactly where she was in Western Massachusetts, which was exactly where I had mapped the aircraft to Flight 175 United. And so when she told me what time it was and what, how low it was, I knew that it was circling around to land at that base. She and knew. She saw it. Wow. Oh, yeah. She amazing. saw it so close that she could see people in the window. She said, I mm-hmm. will never, ever forget that. But when she came out, she had to run to an appointment. And mm-hmm. when she came out and discovered 9-11, you know, New York and D.C. and, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, Shanksville, she said, no, that plane, that had to crash just north of, of my town. It just mm-hmm. had to because it was so low. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just amazing to me. Uh, she did, by the way, uh, supply me with a legal document and assigned notarized affidavit with her statement. Uh, so if if somebody wants to take all this information that I've gathered and take it to court, it's easy to do. I have that in my safe. What do you think Daniel Lewin is up to now? <laughs> he probably beside has, no good. <laughs> he probably has a totally different face. Yeah. And yeah. it's interesting the things that I read about him. You know, his friends said he could kill any human being with a pen and a credit card. Exactly. Yet the official story wants us to believe he was killed with one of those horrible, you know, Home Depot plastic box, <laughs> box cutters. cutters you can't even cut cardboard with. And it's yeah, like, this guy is super deadly. Uh, you don't mess with people like that. A well, trained assassin from Sayeret yeah. Metcall. And interesting uh, about Sayeret Metcall, because, you know, I did a lot of research into Lots of avenues here. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu also is a trained assassin, just so is you know. Is he? Uh-huh. Oh. He's a trained assassin. And so was Ehud Barak. And you'll remember that Ehud Barak was in New York City the night before 9-11. And now, then he, he, was, was, he was up to his eyeballs. <laughs> yeah, he was Sayeret Metkal also. He's a trained, high, highly trained assassin. Yeah. And those people are trained in hostage rescue. And, and when, when I say hostage rescue, so that you're... Listeners understand this. Hostage rescue people are who would meet our aircraft once we landed on the ground. Those people are trained on how Boeing or Airbus doors work, how the PA system works, where our Mm -hmm. emergency equipment they might want to use is. Uh, For instance, there's a crash axe in the cockpit, and uh, they would know how to make PA announcements to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cockpit. And uh, throughout the cabin, there's just different ways you can do it. But they get all that training so they know how the aircraft work. Because when they burst through to liberate you from the hijacker, uh, they uh, need to make a PA and tell you all get on the floor, or, you know, duck down or something. Sure, of course. So yeah. he would have known all of that. And knowing that I know what hostage rescue people are trained to do, I was like, well, he sure had an advantage. Plus, he was fluent in English. Hebrew and Arabic, so he could have understood if somebody was sitting behind him planning that new Pearl Harbor. Now, couldn't he? Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're remarkable people in terms of training and <laughs> lack of, uh, shall we say, conscience. I guess I don't know how how are we designed it. They look upon us as being, well, we're goyim and uh, cattle, dumb, and no respect, none. They are I'm the chosen. Some them up. <laughs> Some What's of those that? Cattle- I'm hoping to wake some of those cattle up because they are getting angry. One of the things about this methodical deception you will see, it's kind of a cute story, Mm -hmm. but it's very, it's soft and very hard hitting. When it comes to the 9-11 stuff, men that read it, and a lot of men are reading it, get madder than hell when they're done. I'll bet. Because that's a reality. And you can't deny that. That's government documents. Yeah, it's, well, when you... Stand on the proof and you construct something like you have on hard data from the government and other sources. 
Uh, it becomes something that will enrage you. Back in just a couple minutes with Rebecca. Hold on. Rebecca's new book, Methodical Deception, is out now. And that goes, of course, hand in hand with Methodical Illusion. And I hope you do get them and read them. Uh, she will autograph them if you go to her site and buy them that way, methodicalillusion.com. You mentioned something earlier about the oh, was it, nearly 350 firefighters who gave their lives. I, I would say that they were murdered. Uh, that's my view of it all, but um, I think you would agree. They, they, their bodies were... What, what do you think happened? What is your best guess? I've read several accounts of this. All right. Well, you know, when I set out to find the planes and the passengers and the crew mm -hmm. members, mm -hmm. I didn't pay too much attention to how the the buildings were taken down. I, since I've been contacted by a couple um, serious scientists that are trying to nudge me in the right direction if I'm interested to look, which I may go into for the next book I do. Well, Judy um, Wood is, is one of those that, that has her own view of things. And, uh, yeah, and she may not be that far off the mark. I, we don't know. She, at. she seems to leave the door open uh, for multiple, I, th I think it's potentially multiple uh, techniques, oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. not just one. Just yeah, go ahead. By nanothermite in the, in the uh, dust, unless some was in there. That's right. Uh, so it, the, I'm sure that they used multiple ways. Now, I, I know about some new laser weapons, and these are now weapons that are public knowledge. Now, you can go in and look and see how they've got some planes. Uh, well, the Air Force is going to put laser weapons on their uh, jet fighters by the year 2020. So in five years, they'll be standard equipment. They have them on some of the other aircraft Correct. right now already, yeah. and some ground units as well. Mm -hmm. The technology in the Navy ships, weapons. you bet. We're 50, 50 years behind what the research and development is. Old cliche, but never more true. At least 50 in some and cases. So one yeah. of the things that as I continue digging into these companies and how they're all related uh, is I keep finding that um, all of these, the military industrial complex now includes companies that are involved with uh, IT, Internet technology, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, uh, computer uh, and telephone communications, all communications, and biotech companies. And the biotech companies are often involved with uh, neurological uh, things, or our nerves. And so I, I'm feeling, my gut feeling, if you want to ask my gut, uh, is that this whole military-industrial complex is somehow wrapped up in the chem trailing that we see. Because there's, that's a, there's a, a major connection. I don't know what it is, and I've been watching them since 1995, 96. Uh, yes, agreed. I, I believe, I mean, if it were something that were killing us, now it may be killing us slowly, but if it were something killing us, we'd see the death rate increase, and we haven't. So I'm, be, I'm leaning toward uh, this being something uh, to help. Uh, in the space war, this space war is real, and it's <laughs> those things are really out there. The weapons that they have in the the space war category, and you can I mean just Google search some of this stuff. Yeah. That's kind of what I do to find stuff, and then I just dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And but I'm finding that the, I think that's where the trail's going. It's really interesting because after I did Methodical Illusion, I wasn't planning on doing a sequel because I didn't know I was going to get all this. Uh, eyewitnesses and all these people and and I've had people from the military base that told me they were locked out the base had been evacuated and they were locked out for two or three days hmm. and so that was my first indicator that boy was I right on and that's exactly where the planes were taken because the phone calls work and so then I started to see that this was kind of a movie and uh, interesting thing as I was looking and I'm, I'm thinking you know I remember right after 9-11 when I went back to work every man just about every guy that, that was, certainly anyone that was a military, firefighter, cop, or sometimes just a big old guy, six foot one, 200 pounder, was come through the door and sometimes hand me their seat number and say, if anybody gives you any, any guff, <laughs> I'll kick their butt. Let me know. Really? Jay. Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. That was so yeah. common. And I, I oftentimes would, at the end of my trip on my labor, I was thinking, well, why didn't that happen on 9-11? I'm, I'm, because these men, you know, basically said, well, hey, I'll, I'll you know, I'll just get it up and, and take them down. And that's what happens nowadays, right? So 
as I'm looking at the people who made phone calls and stuff, the things that just amazed me is that Flight 11, for example, lo and behold, they had a Hollywood producer. They had, I don't know, four or five Raytheon electronic warfare specialists. Uh-huh. On. Uh-huh. There was a retired astronaut who worked for the BAE systems. Huh. And so we went over that last time, the BAE yeah, systems. Yeah. And um, there was a highly trained assassin on board. There was a linebacker, mm-hmm. a guy, a 25-year-old uh, football star. Uh, he also played uh, varsity basketball, not a little guy. There were super athletes on board that boxers, linebackers, uh, you know, athletic people. Right. And two professional hockey players. And I'll never forget the first charter I did of a hockey team. I almost quit flying. Ah. <laughs> Those guys are mean, and they're tough. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm looking at this, and there's at least a dozen men right there Mm -hmm. that were over six foot, and they were athletic and strong and would have kicked butt, just like all those guys came on and told me, if the scenario were what it was. I mean, look at that list. A Hollywood producer and a a trained assassin. We could make a movie here. And I think that's That's what they were doing. And, you know, one of the things I told my husband when I put it all together is if they would have asked a flight attendant uh, to be a, you know, like in the movie, they have a consultant. Uh Uh-huh. If they would have asked a flight attendant to be a consultant on this uh, B movie they put together called 9-11. Yeah. They wouldn't have got caught. But you see, it's it's doing things like having flight attendants call their mom and dad or calling their husband. You would not do that. You would call crew scheduling or a company security number, usually crew scheduling, because that number you know by heart. And they they have the button, so they can call. They can literally click on and pull in the security of corporate security and the FAA all at once. So there are places where we would have called, and I none of the flight attendants did that. And so that's why I said, well, even Betty Young said, I don't know. I don't know. We might be being hijacked. I don't know. Well, you know if you're being hijacked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you sure, sure and do. So, it was really interesting. Another thing, but was this asked, a case of voice modulation? No, they were really there. They were mm-hmm. really on a phone, uh, probably in an office in the hangar. I'm uh-huh. gonna guess. Um, yeah. yeah. Although maybe some of them use their cell phone. I mean, Amy Sweeney's boss, her, her supervisor, was a personal friend, so he said she called from her cell phone, and she called. Uh, two or three times, but basically was on the phone for nearly a half an hour. And so when I, mean, I started to see, you know, stuff going on that just they 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 were being told to do something, but it wasn't protocol. It wasn't what you would do if you were a flight attendant. Yeah, Somebody was telling them to do that. They were afraid. Uh, and yeah. they had probably had to do it. And so I'm looking at stuff, you know, like on the airplane, we have something called a cars. You may have read about that or heard about, about that. And it's a text messaging system. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting. This It's called Air, uh, it's owned by a company called ARINC, Aeronautical Radio Incorporated. Well, they're owned by Rockwell Collins. And lo and behold, if I didn't find that Rockwell had just been into American Airlines reservation lines where Betty On called in and only four and a half minutes of her call was recorded, they had just upgraded the emergency system at American Airlines Reservation Office right there. And so when she called in and they pressed the red button to to record the entire emergency call, only Mm -hmm. four and a half minutes after that upgrade could be recorded from that glitch. Well, what are the chances that that company (laughs) is involved with the ACARS company? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And guess what? A-R-I-N-C is owned by the Carlyle Group. Oh, God. I'm just so, all you know, sickening. Yeah, when I started to look through this, I was like, well, this is really weird. There was another guy that had a really weird connection, too. He was actually uh, Colonel Robert Marr, and he was the head of NIAD's northeast section of NORAD on 9-11. He had retired from the military. He went back to see a friend in D.C. that hired him to come back and run NIAD's. Uh-huh. And so in that 20 months that he was retired, guess where he was working? For Phoenix Air. And you will remember... I know Phoenix. I know about Phoenix Air. Go ahead. Yeah. And so they were uh, one of those, uh, they ran Learjet 35s and 36s doing um, renditions for uh, prisoners. Yeah, you know what they're doing now? They're uh, flying, they're flying, well, they were flying Ebola patients yes, they back were the- here. Now they're flying XXDRTB patients all over the place. One of my people, uh, Dr. Patricia Doyle, tracks Phoenix Air all the time. They've got three planes. They're gray. And they're flying constantly back and forth to Europe, to here, to there, to uh, 
the NIH facility. They're flying to Florida. They're flying to Georgia. Uh, anyway, they're bringing people back here, sick, sick people. Mm. And then nobody knows anything about it. It's unbelievable. Well, it's interesting that Phoenix Air was also associated with another company called Hoffman Aviation. And you'll remember, now this is the, the Colonel Robert Marr. He was the head of NEADS on 9-11. Uh-huh. Hoffman Aviation taught, supposedly, according to the government, Mohammed Atta and Walid El Shahri. Right. How to f- Puddle jumpers, <laughs> how to Cessnas. Fly. Yeah, how right. To, how to fly. And there's a connection to the man who was running uh, NEADS. I mean, it's crazy. But here's another thing that's really concerning to me. Ashton Carter, who's currently yeah, our, uh, yeah. De- Secretary of Defense, yeah. he was on the board of trustees with MITRE. He's also Oh, from- all right. There's your and Jewish he, connection directly. He, <laughs> and he worked with uh, the CIA, ex-CIA uh, director, John, uh, John Deutsch. Uh-huh. He was a part of a, something called Catastrophic Terrorism Study Group in 1997. So he also helped ad, uh, to advise and create the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah, okay. well, he want, that guy wants to take us to a big-time war. Yes. Uh, he's, he's a very dangerous man. Yes, very much so. And it's just amazing to see all of this. And it's one of the things I just wanted to help a reader see as they're starting to wake up kind of gently uh, is because you can go Google search everything. It's all out there. I mean, it the is all out there. It is. It, she's right, <laughs> folks. It is all out there. You, you may not be talking to the biggest audience in talk radio in the world, but it's big. And these people are smart. This, I say it is without question the best audience in talk radio. Uh, Catherine Austin Fitz, former Undersecretary of HUD under Reagan, told me once, she said, Jeff, wherever I go in the world, wherever I go, sooner or later in a conversation of substance, rents comes up. So they listen, and they're listening right now very carefully. Uh, probably some of the people you've mentioned. Probably a lot of the people you've mentioned. <laughs> Well, hello there, everyone. Um, I always uh, say good night to the NSA because I know they get into my my stuff. Oh no, yeah, but you know it's okay. I mean, it, it's it really is what it is, you know. And we just there's not much we can do about it. Yeah, yeah it, listen, you either <laughs> go down in flames or go down on your knees. But it, it's interesting. People need to look up this company called Mitre. It's M I T R E. It's all capital letters. It's a nonprofit company that manages the federally funded research and development centers for the Department of Defense. Mm-hmm. Run the FAA, the IRS, the Veterans Administration, Department of Homeland Security. Jeez. Uh, Administrative Office of the United States Courts on behalf of the federal judiciary, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare, and something you'll remember from 9-11, the National Institute of Standard and Technologies, also known as NIST. They got the whole thing. And lo and behold, when I'm looking at those guys that made the phone calls on 9-11, if I didn't find one of their employees making a phone call, telling his... This is really amazing what what you've found. (laughs) It is amazing. And and your your mental ability to keep it all filed and to access it and to present it uh, in such a a cogent way is uh, is quite remarkable. Well, you know, people get mad at me sometimes that I wrote this as a novel. But listen, I I know most people can't do that kind of research. And I thought, well, if I can deliver all this in a novel, and you can contact me on email or whatever, uh, call me, whatever you want. Uh, I can share information or tell you how to Google search and find it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, Mm -hmm. I cover in the book the DEA report, the 61-page report that caught all of those traveling art students, those Israeli art students. And it's in the methodicaldeception.com webpage, and there's some pictures of them. And and some of them were Mossad bomb experts. Well, I didn't choose their career, and I didn't put them in the World Trade Center, but boy, have I attacked on exposing that. Wow! And so, you know, I, I just, when I get attacked like that, I just block their email and Block them on Facebook. Well, that's all you can do, really, yeah. logically, so, pragmatically. But I don't know. I'm right over the target. And so now when I see people that are uh, maybe, you know, claiming that they, that something other than explosives were used, I think, well, you know, are you protecting these guys? Because they were explosive specialists. They were bomb experts, like ordnance specialists that were pretending to be art students in there that day. They took out the window. Oh, yeah. 
and and since then they had the run of the place and they could have gone back anytime they wanted there was absolutely no security to stop well them. they had one whole floor uh mm-hmm. sealed and off 16th, uh, 16th or something what was it 91st, 91st floor 91st i can't I really yeah and that's where that. they took a window out for their <clears throat> A gelatin uh, art group uh, called. They uh, did a book called the Bee Thing, and they put a took a window out and put a balcony and all of this without getting caught by security. Not security on the ground in New mm-hmm. York City in the mm-hmm. buildings. Mm-hmm. It's kind of in your face, but that fact right there has really uh, shaken up a lot of trolls. This second book has really got them angry. I bet. And, uh, I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Uh, this well, this I, is. Uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say I should have books to send you by uh, Thursday. Oh, that's <laughs> so fine. No, that's Don't fine. The the uh, the dancing Israelis. Come on. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, what strings do we have from miter to Israel to the Israelis? Well, Ashton Carter is. Um, <laughs> he's, Ashton he, he's a rope. I, he's not a string. Is yeah. <laughs> Oh, you know, if you just look at one of the things I found that's really interesting is um, these companies, they play musical chairs. They buy each other. And, they and do, of course, absolutely. Yeah, and they buy each other out, and then they falter, and then the other person he just bought out buys them back. It's that That's what was going on with Tracor and Westmark and Bobby Ray Inman. And the, and, and the CIA always shows up. I mean, we're looking at Phoenix Air. That is a CIA rendition airline. That's yes, what they it is. Do. And yep. the fact that Colonel Robert Marr, now he's the guy who really didn't help scramble the jets that morning. <laughs> I mean, people want to know who should have lost their job. I mean, if I were in one of those jets or someone I knew was, mm-hmm. I, I didn't know those kids personally, but um, I, I would be asking, well, why didn't NORAD scramble those jets? Well, where was this guy and the fact that now you've got him connected to Hoffman Aviation, Phoenix Air, and the flight school that taught supposedly Mohammed Atta mm-hmm. and one of the Al Shahris. I mean, does do you need to see more than this? Do people really need to see? And I don't know if it's just that they couldn't put it all together because it's very simple to me. It's very. Well, you have a, you just... have a unique mind. Uh, you're <laughs> very organized, very pragmatic, and you have a burning desire to get to the bottom of something. That's not very common anymore. Not in a reactive society. We're not proactive. You're you're hyper proactive, and that's the uh, advantage that we have. Uh, well, I'll I'll do all your literature. research. Put it out there. <laughs> yeah. I could do a nonfiction book with all of my notes. <laughs> you could. You know, I could. I, I really could. I just kind of jokingly told my husband that, but you have no idea. I mean, what's that'd it's be fascinating kind of, reading. No, that <laughs> would that would. Be. My email would be fascinating email. I, I mean, to read, I could put it all in a book. Just you know, ch- change people's names and stuff. But when I saw things like uh, that connection with the uh, security, I, as a flight attendant, I said, "Well, how did they get mace and pepper spray and knives and box cutters and not, uh, guns and bombs on board? Mm-hmm. Who was running security? That was one of the th- first things I looked into, and I found it, again, an Israeli company. Uh, same ICT. one. Yeah. yeah. At, I'm uh, like, port- well, then when I found out that the Secretary of Transportation at the time of 9-11 has joined them as sitting on their board of directors, I almost fell over. I was like, what? They failed so bad. And, and I said this out loud to my husband. This company failed America so bad yeah. on 9-11 that why would the Secretary of Transportation, my husband said, well, maybe they didn't fail. Maybe they did exactly what they wanted, and he's in bed with them. So it well, wasn't would, You really- know, that's not a bad argument, and it, it almost makes too much sense. Uh, he'd, he'd have to be. Yeah. Well, I mean, I why would you go it. with... I know. Because but... ICTS, you'll remember, they let Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, on and Abdul yeah. Muttalib. They escorted and... him on. Yes. And so, I mean, this is not something that got cleared up at 9-11. This is still out there. All right. And so, you know, all American, era, all, not American Airlines, all United States air carriers now are equipped with remote control. None of them just so, don't have... So you, just, folks, so you understand... The plane you fly on may be flown technically by the pilots, but at any time it can be taken over remotely, okay? And the pilots are locked out, basically. They can sit up there, but the plane's being controlled from remote locations. And it can be landed anywhere, just like Anywhere. What do you think, Rebecca, of the chances, seriously, in the next five, six, seven days of something big happening? 
Ah, uh, well. Uh, the stock market thing bothers me. Uh, yeah. That's that's an interesting coincidence. If there are any coincidences anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I find I found that really interesting. And we're we are overdue for it. Let's be honest. The yeah. country is bankrupt. The people are a hundred million Americans, give or take, who want to work, who are able to work. There are no jobs for them. We got fifty to sixty million illegals here in this country from scores of countries around the world. Same thing that's happening to Europe now, but Europe is more graphic. Only, by the way, only ten percent of the so-called refugees that are invading Europe are Syrian. Ninety percent are others. Mm-hmm. Understand. Uh-huh. From from sub-Saharan Africa, from India, from all over the place, Pakistan, and they're flooding into Europe. And somebody said how they all appear to be, so many of them, young, fighting-age men <laughs> that are coming over. They're, I noticed that in a photograph I saw there were no women. No, and there were, there's a few, a but they're special. tokens. Uh-huh. No, uh, this is not looking good for any of us. It's It's like they're moving into their... It's it's Act Four, and it's going to be really ugly. Mm-hmm. It's the final act, and they, they've got us softened up. Uh, I, you know, all I can say is that the the Russians know what's going on. They've been so diplomatic. Once in a while, they'll almost say something, and then they stop. And it's not necessarily Putin; it'll be an underling. But they know what's going on exactly. Well, when uh, Edward Snowden left the country. I said to my husband, he knows more than I found because he was in the NSA. Can you imagine me in the me in uh-huh. the NSA? Oh, God. <laughs> digging in there like a little mole. They, um, yeah. I mean, he has to know more than I found out. Has to. No, uh-huh. He does. He does. But that's why he left the country. Yeah. I don't know how Assange is getting his information. Uh, he's completely in a cage, but uh, he used to know a lot. He probably still does. Yeah, they're all connected. They they are. Sorry. It's it's quite amazing the whole mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Well, let's well, remo- I, go ahead. I was going to say. Well, I I just this last week was contacted by um, w- one of my main heroes and somebody I've actually dreamed about asking, but I didn't know how to uh, to write a forward for my very first book, and was complimented by uh, Jim Mars. Oh, he's a dear friend. And I was I I got an email from him and I called him and he was like your research is unbelievable and so I'm actually um, going to do an interview with him because he's going to be on a talk network Mike Adams new uh, radio platform that he's starting and so I was like oh my God you're my hero he just sent me his book and I sent <laughs> sent him two of my one of each of my books today I was like he got wow. my last books. and um, Jim and I, I know- go way back. Oh, what a! I mean, I, I was like, oh my God, you're like my hero. Yeah. <laughs> I was like dreaming, how could I get to him and write a forward and read the galley and all this? And he's just like, he must have heard. Maybe he heard it he on your show. He probably was listening. And uh, yeah, I was just like so flattered. He's like, well, I have some notes you probably want, and I said, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't even care what yeah. he's done. Well, like, he's he is he is as good as they get. He's just oh. a he's an extraordinary human being. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I'm feeling very blessed that wonderful people are coming forward. I've got several from uh, Hollywood ranks that tell me mm-hmm. that there really are people that want to get the truth out there. And so, and you'll see when you read the books, both of them would make great movies. And everyone sure. says, oh, this would make such a great movie. I'm sure. I'm I'm so happy about the Jim Mars connection. It just won't get any better than that. You're right. Oh, if you're going to have a hero, he's the one. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. Static about it. I, I just see he's such, uh, an incredible researcher, and he delivers his stuff so beautifully as well. I know. So. Well, he's on twice a month. He'll be on this Thursday, and we always basically have fun oh. um, to try and get away from the grief and the angst. And uh, yeah. it's just he's a kick. He's just he's a just a remarkable man, and so are you, a remarkable person. Thank you again for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, next time something is uh, needing to be put on the radio, don't forget. Let me know. Oh, I certainly will uh, if I hear something on this intelligence. And uh, anytime there's an airplane thing, you're welcome to contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca, very much. Take good care. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night. Rebecca Roth. And uh, there you go.
Ben Cardova Law School. She goes to law school and she graduates and goes right to the top of the pig pile in Washington, D.C. She it's joined- amazing how they fast track their own. Jeez. Yeah, it's amazing. She goes into uh, a law firm called Wilmer Cutler and Pickering. Now, Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering, they have a really interesting background. Cutler was the White House counsel for Carter and Bill Clinton. I remember him. And part uh, another partner was C. Boyden Gray. C. Boyden Gray was the White House counsel for uh, George H.W. Bush when he was vice president and president. There's wow. another interesting partner at this law firm with Barbara Olson, mm-hmm. Jamie Gorlick, who sat on the commission, 9-11 commission. There was somebody else who's really interesting, and I found that part of the cover-up was through the FBI. But the former FBI director, Robert Mueller, was also a partner in the same law firm as Barbara Olson. Oh, my. This is is wild. How do you sleep at night with all this data? You've got it all. I'm constantly doing research, and it's much deeper than this. We could go on for three hours, I kid you not. So another person. I believe you who's interesting, that was in that same law firm, William Weld. He was the governor at Massachusetts, mm-hmm. and he also was the the coach for George W. Bush for the debates against uh, John Kerry. He was his coach. Huh. I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Barbara Olson, she was right in there with some very interesting connected people to the CIA and the FBI. And so then I go to their client list, and lo and behold, fasten your seatbelt. Jeff Rance, you are never going to believe, in alphabetical order, who's at the top of the list. 9B, remember I told you the name? Yes, yes. Akamai Technologies is a client of Barbara Olson's law firm that she went Uh, to work with. All in the family. Unbelievable. But it gets better going down the alphabetical list. Amdocs. Amdocs was I know about Amdocs. (laughs) <laughs> and they monitored every phone call <clears throat> yeah. in the United States because they were part of billing systems. They do um, the billing, folks, for your cell phone, for your mm-hmm. most probably your landline, but all almost virtually all cell phones, all mobile phones, portable phones, smartphones, smart devices, Amdocs. Well, apparently, there is no company in the United States competent enough to do it, so they have to contract it out to an Israeli company. Amazing, isn't it? Yes. There's another company called Analog Devices, and they work with missile technology and, and drones. And another one, <laughs> AT&T, you know, that's a communication company. But here's the one that really got me, uh-huh. stopped me right in my tracks. Yeah. Avid Technologies. They're a company that specializes in video and audio um, production technology, and they specialize in something that's called digital, specializes in video and audio um, production technology, and they specialize in something that's called digital nonlinear editing. It's mm-hmm. NLE. Now, this is something that's like a cut and paste of live video editing. And a great example of that is since it's NFL season starting up. Now, in the last few years, you remember you've seen this, the line of scrimmage shows up as a bright orange line. But if you're in the stadium, you can't see that. That's just that's done through this live editing. And they also put in the teams and the arrows that the Dallas Cowboys are going this way. And, and you don't see that. And the advertisements that they put around the stadium, you don't see those if you're in the stadium. They don't exist. Hmm. They're put in through using the Avid Technologies mm-hmm. non linear editing system. So I wonder if maybe something like a Tomahawk cruise missile were going toward the South Tower, if this same technology could be used to make it look like a 767. I'm just wondering. I'm not sure, but I'm just wondering, and I find it interesting. Another um, interesting... There were supposedly no windows visible on some of those aircraft. That's correct. And the firefighters from the fire boat I've listened to, they're uh, calling into dispatch, and they said it was a military aircraft, like a bomber style with windows, dark green or gray or something. Well, Uh this same law firm also represents Boeing, Citicorp, the uh, Credit Suisse Bank, Deutsche Bank, the HSBC, which everyone knows is just CIA money laundering, and the UBS Bank. And if you've looked into any of the terrorist financing with Mm -hmm. Scott and those things, the UBS Bank is right in there. Mm -hmm. And they also were sitting in a special investigative committee hired by the board of directors for Enron and WorldCom. Good God. 
still remember Enron. <laughs> the evidence for their trial, which was going to trial the next month in October of 2000. Oh, man. In Building 7, the Solomon Building that fell down without yeah. being an aircraft. At 5.20 that afternoon, all of the evidence. Lost. Forever. Doggone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is really something. I talk about <laughs> all in the family. I mean, the inner connectivity of this is just enough to want to make you puke. These people are thicker than thieves. Thicker it's, than thieves. It is. This isn't even the tip of the iceberg. Oh, I mean, come on, Rebecca. I, this is unbelievable. Four hours today with John B. Wells. <laughs> I think he sliced three of it into a video or a show. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And he, honest to goodness, he had to get up and take a break. He was sick to his stomach. He felt like, I mean, we went into this so in-depth yeah. that this is nothing. But this is just an example of what I did with everyone. So they uh, evacuated the nerve gas from the plane and uh, chucked him out of there, got rid of him. <laughs> Yeah, well, most of the large bases like that, and that is the second largest base in area in the United States. Uh huh. Uh, most of them have large incinerators, so it's hard. Oh, to they see. burned them up. They probably yeah. did. I'm yeah. gonna guess. I mean, they had that base. Those people were locked out for three days. Plenty of time to cremate them all, not cremate, burn them all. These are probably very high temperature. Furnaces they use, not like crematories, which are about 600 degrees. These are probably much more, like 1,000, 1,500. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just guessing, but uh, they would probably have the state-of-the-art available to them. This yeah, is, it, uh, this it is, is amazing. Sickening. Yeah. What Another thing that I found, uh, you know, when I first looked at this, I, I read all the stories and I I kind of fell into that whole emotional thing and... On Flight 175, there were two people that called, and there were two men, passengers. One was a pilot that had flown in the Gulf War. And it's such a small world, Jeff, that his pilot, actually, his pilot's wife, contacted me on email and said, Brian Sweeney was not a pilot. I said, well, that's what the FBI document says. I sent it to her an email. And she said he was a radar uh, uh, radar intercepting officer. Uh-huh, radar so intercept officer, sure. Yeah. He writes in the back seat. I said, oh, really? Well, well, that's interesting that the FBI called him a pilot, and so did his mom. So I just kind of put that around. For some reason, I decided to look into him. And I actually went on his online obituaries, and everybody can find this stuff. I haven't found this. Is not I'm not privy to any magic information. Everything I found is just through looking for it. And I found his obituary, and I'm reading and reading, having a cup of coffee, and keep reading down, and all of a sudden... Someone says to him, I remember you, Brian, from the M cafeteria when we both worked at MITRE. Now, MITRE and PTEC were two companies that Andira Singh told us about were working in the FAA headquarters for two years prior to 9-11. God, more, th th this is all Mossad. Uh-huh. Yep. And so here he is. He's sitting at row 31, left-hand side of the aircraft, and I have gotten a terabyte of Freedom of Information Act data where uh -huh. they claim where those planes were. And now it's impossible that he was anywhere near where they claim the plane was 7,000-foot elevation over the Hudson River, looking off the left side of the aircraft, a beautiful view 7,000 feet above. Yeah, yeah. Newark International Airport. And he tells his mother at that moment that they're over Ohio. And I'm thinking, well, how could you be over the Hudson? And if you look out the right side, you're seeing Manhattan skyline and the Statue of Liberty. The intelligence is monitoring for right now. You heard what I just said. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, can I get an update? Can you get a hold of that guy? I mean, how? what are they thinking? Are they thinking September? Is this uh, going along with the market crash? Is Because you see what the market's doing now. It's doing the same roller coaster. And, you know, the American people are so cool. I have gotten someone that contacted me that was watching this roller coaster pre-9-11 as well and contacted me and said, I'm a market watcher. I watch the charts. And mm -hmm. this is doing mm -hmm. the same thing before the last false flag of 9-11. And so I think the only way we right can... Now. Yes, right now. It's uh -huh. going up right now. It goes up 300 points, down 300 points. And it's like a roller coaster. Yeah. And so what, what this person was telling me is this last 
X amount of days or weeks that he's been monitoring. He said, I just have to give you a heads up. We are right now on the verge, just exactly where we were pre-9-11. Well, remember about uh, a month or two ago, the chatter began to be heard, if you listen real carefully, that end of September, 24, 26, 27, 23rd, somewhere in that week, and we're in that week right now, something exactly. very major was going to happen. Now, this is very interesting what you're telling me. Yeah, well, I thought it was very interesting that someone in security... Uh, would have heard that and wanted to know. I mean, yeah. I'm not an agent. I don't care what they say. <laughs> if I am, I busted him. Oh, in both um, yeah. But I, I, I read about it in an Israeli newspaper. Now, here's the thing that really freaked me out. As soon as I read that to my husband, I went, wait a minute. I was just over on Drudge, and I went back and I checked CNN, ABC, NBC, every news and Drudge, because he kind of covers everything, and not one word was said in one American newspaper. They were talking about Kim Kardashian or some nonsense. Uh -huh. And I'm like, this is important news. A biological, a chemical, and a nuclear attack in six of our cities is major news. And not one person was saying it. And I was like, wild. I got home about maybe six or eight hours later, went to my laptop, and I went, went to pull that back up, and it was scrubbed. Oh, and I yeah. told my husband, this was a message to people who know what's coming, just like the Odigo text message was. Don't go. They didn't tell them they were going to blow up the towers. They just said, don't go to work in the towers today. Don't go anywhere near the towers today, I, I suppose. They might have said in their text message to those Jews. Yeah, yeah. Well, they you didn't know, I go. guess we, we could maybe sign up for Odigo text services. And find I, think it's, I think it's a good <laughs> idea. Jeez. I mean, I'm just blown away. So that's why I decided I better talk about that because I know you have a pretty good sized audience. And I think the only way we can stop this, because we know this, and we've talked about it earlier, the Israelis monitor social media. And if you are out on social media, you oh. need to be repeating that they have a false flag planned again. They were behind 9-11. And get it out there. Shine that light on those cockroaches so they don't do this. It's our only hope. Right? Autographed, and I'll send them out to you. Oh, yes. um, Illusion.com, methodicaldecision.com, and RebeccaRoth.com. And it's Rebecca spelled the bit biblical way with the K R E B. Nice. Yeah, I noticed my webmaster fixed that. Yeah, and and so uh, I I I love doing autograph books. It connects me with the readers, and they share. Oh, it's a very very special thing to do. I'm I'm it's glad. Awesome. Well, here's something that happened to me after I did a radio show. Uh -huh. A woman contacted me. Yeah. And she said, "You have vindicated me." Uh, for 14 years, people were saying I was crazy, uh -huh. and I said, "Well, really, why?" Well. Here's her story. This is now in a notarized affidavit in my safe. And mm -hmm. this is her story. But this is not her name. Mm -hmm. But it's in the novel, De uh, Methodical Deception. Mm -hmm. She said, my name is Sarah Swain. And I was living in Otis, Massachusetts on September 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm. At approximately 8.30, 8.35, I saw a United Airlines plane fly over my residence at the time. And I was so shocked because the plane was so low. I could see the people in the windows. I was standing on a deck on the second floor and I was watching the plane fly over the top of the house and I lost track of it because of the way the building was but I do think that it was going north when it flew over the house and after I lost sight of it I was speaking with my neighbor and we were just amazed at the height of the plane I it was so low I shouldn't say height I mean altitude it was so low we were flabbergasted now I know that it was approximately 830 I would say no later than 845 at the latest because I had to go to an appointment in the next town over and be there by 930 uh -huh. and I left five minutes after I saw the plane and headed to Great Barrington now this town Otis Massachusetts is not the Air Force Base this is due west of Westover Air Force Base in western Massachusetts. I had tracked Flight United 175 mm -hmm. on the, uh, their flight plan mm -hmm. to just south of Westover, and I knew that they had to fly directly over Otis. And when she called wow. me, it's all confirmed. This is not a conspiracy. Every pilot and flight attendant that's read these books and yeah my interviews has said this is it now i have a woman who's willing to go to court the affidavit signed and notarized you be careful uh young lady very <laughs> careful i mean it's thank god you've gotten this out it's out you're safe if you can get the information out that gives you a measure of safety 
And yeah, I was that's, very cautious with the first book. I, yeah. Nobody knew about it. I even had to self-edit it. I couldn't trust anybody. Oh, good for you. You yeah. used, you know, you did it right. You did it right. All that extra work was worth it. Wrong. That my, I just put my brain on. Uh, don't go there. Look, I'm not going to go there because I flew for a few years after that. And listen, when you're flying. Your safety net is NORAD and the U.S. military. And I've had jets scrambled for me before for different incidences over my career. Huh. And they come to your wingtips, and it's very frightening because sometimes you can see their arms, armament hanging from them. And uh, they'll maybe shoot you down. You just don't know. But the feeling is horrible, except they do scramble and come to, to your rescue in six minutes. On that day, it took almost two hours. And... After Whoops, nine, something wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, my first question was, um, well, when somebody called me and said, turn your television on right now, and I'd just gotten home from Europe, and I'd, I'd come in as a purser, so mm -hmm. I hadn't seen any FAA uh, warnings about hijackers or anything, or Al-Qaeda, and we'd never been told about uh, Tim Osman, I mean, uh, Osama bin Laden. Tim or, Osman, yes. <laughs> or I later on found out he was a CIA asset in the yeah. mid-80s. To start yeah. up the Mujahideen for the CIA. And so I, I didn't know about him or um, Osama bin Laden or Al-Qaeda. They had never told us or warned us that this could be possible, a hijacking group. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was so shocked. I saw that second plane go into the South Tower like a hot knife through butter. And honestly, I thought it was either trick photography or a new rendition of War, on the, War of the Worlds. Wow. I thought it was somebody was joking because mm -hmm. planes cannot disappear into a steel building. They're made of aluminum. And if you've ever seen an aircraft that's been in a real major hailstorm or hit by a large bird, they do a lot of damage. Those, those planes are very fragile. I've seen them take a bird strike and a lightning hmm. strike and, mm -hmm. and see what happens. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I really thought it was some kind of trick photography, and I, I really I had jet lag, and I didn't know what was going on. And the person on the other end of the phone was saying, it's terrorists. And I'm like, well, you know, later on that day, I said, well, how did they get control of NORAD? <laughs> how did they control our military? That was my main question is, so how could somebody on a, you know, the laptop and a satellite phone right. stop NORAD from scrambling? And how, uh, how many hours? Well, they were an hour and 45 minutes, I believe. My goodness. Close to yeah. New York. Yeah, yeah. But it's really interesting what happened. Well, then we get the story about, uh, who was it, Leon Panetta? I can't remember now. About Dick Cheney being told. Yeah, and that was Norman Mineta. Norman Mineta, not Leon was, Panetta. Yeah, see, with <clears> this <throat> Kind of yeah. like they could be a part of the same song. Mm -hmm. He was actually in the bunker with uh, Vice President Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. A young soldier would come in and say to the Vice President, uh, the aircraft is 20 miles out. So hey, was I know about MDOCs. <laughs> and they monitored every phone call. <clears throat> yeah. In the United States, because they were part of billing systems. They do um, the billing, folks, for your cell phone, for your yeah. most probably your landline, but all almost virtually all cell phones, all mobile phones, portable phones, smartphones, smart devices, Amdocs. Well, apparently, there is no company in the United States competent enough to do it, so they have to contract it out to an Israeli company. Amazing, isn't it? Yes. There's another company called Analog Devices, and they work with missile technology and, and drones. And another one, <laughs> AT&T, you know, that's a communication company. But here's the one that really got me, uh -huh. stopped me right in my tracks. Yeah. Avid Technologies. They're a company that specializes in video and audio um, production technology, and they specialize in something that's called digital nonlinear editing. It's mm -hmm. NLE. Now, this is something that's like a cut and paste of live video editing. And a great example of that is since it's NFL season starting up, now, in the last few years, you remember you've seen this, the line of scrimmage shows up as a bright orange line. But if you're in the stadium, you can't see that. That's just that's done through this live editing. And they also put in the teams and the arrows that the Dallas Cowboys are going this way. And, and you don't see that. And the advertisements that they put around the stadium, you don't see those if you're in the stadium. They don't exist. Hmm. They're put in through using the Avid Technologies mm -hmm. 
linear editing system. So I wonder if maybe something like a Tomahawk cruise missile were going toward the South Tower, if this same technology could be used to make it look like a 767. I'm just wondering. I, I'm not sure, but I'm just wondering, and I find it interesting. Another um, interesting... There were supposedly no windows visible on some of those aircraft. That's correct. And the firefighters from the fire boat I've listened to, they're uh, calling into dispatch, and they said it was a military aircraft, like a bomber style yeah. with no yeah. windows, dark green or gray or something. Well, uh-huh. this same law firm also represents Boeing, Citicorp, the uh, Credit Suisse Bank, Deutsche Bank, the HSBC, which everyone knows is just CIA money laundering, and the UBS Bank. And if you've looked into any of the terrorist financing with Scott mm-hmm. Bennett and those things, the UBS Bank is right in there. Mm-hmm. And they also were sitting in a special investigative committee hired by the board of directors for Enron and WorldCom. Good God. So- you remember Enron, <laughs> the evidence for their trial, which was going to trial the next month in October of 2000. Oh, man. In Building 7, the Solomon Building that fell down without yeah. being an aircraft, claimed that they knew 9-11 was going to happen, too, after it happened. They, they were That's right. They did. So this is what struck me, because this was about two and a half years ago, maybe, that I'm reading this, but... It to me was a signal that there is, you know, people in the know, kind of like the Odigo text messaging that yeah. that told people not to go into the World Trade Center towers. And only about what three or four or five Jews went to work that day. The twelve or fourteen hundred didn't. Something like that. I, I heard four thousand got the text. Was message. it four thousand? No. Oh. Yeah. And so I'm reading this, and here's how the article basically went. The Israeli intelligence had intercepted chatter and plans that the Al-Qaeda, now they've kind of been huh. released, was yeah. planning to attack five or six major United States cities using biological, chemical, and nuclear weaponry over a nine-day period. And if that happens here, which it could, because don't forget, they are the only uh, country in the world that has the written out there, you can go find it online, the Samson option to nuclearly attack. It's, it's really important people, under, we should, go ahead, but I'm going to come back to the Samson option. That's mm-hmm. it's, it's critical. Go ahead. And so, um, so the other day I did an interview with someone and the host called me back a couple of days later and said, I have a friend who's kind of in security intelligence, some, you know, in that field. And he contacted me and said, how did that retirement retired flight attendant know what the United States intelligence is monitoring for right now? He heard what I just said. Mm -hmm. I'm like, can I get an update? Can you get a hold of that guy? I mean, how, what are they thinking? Are they thinking September? Is this uh, going along with the market crash? Is it because you see what the market's doing now? It's doing the same roller coaster. And, you know, the American people are so cool. I have gotten someone that contacted me that was watching this roller coaster pre 9 11 as well and contacted me and said, I'm a market watcher. I watch the charts. And mm-hmm. this is doing mm-hmm. the same thing before the last false flag of 9 11. And so I think the only way we right can. Right now. Yes, right now. It's uh-huh. going up right now. It goes up 300 points, down 300 points. And it's like a roller coaster. Yeah. And so what, what this person was telling me is this last X amount of days or weeks that he's been monitoring, he said, I just have to give you a heads up. We are right now on the verge, just exactly where we were pre-9-11. Well, remember about uh, a month or two ago, the chatter began to be heard, if you listen real carefully, that end of September... 24, 26, 27, 23rd, somewhere in that week, and we're in that week right now, something very major was going to happen. Now, this is very interesting what you're telling me. Yeah, well, I thought it was very interesting that someone in security uh, would have heard that and wanted to know. I mean, I'm not an agent. I don't care what they say. (laughs) If I am, I busted him in both um, yeah. But I, I, I read about it in an Israeli newspaper. Now, here's the thing that really freaked me out. As soon as I read that to my husband, I went, wait a minute. I was just over on drug. No, I mean, yeah. I'm not an agent. I don't care what they say. <laughs> if I am, I busted him. Oh. In both. Um, yeah. But I, I, I read about it in an Israeli newspaper. Now, here's the thing that really freaked me out. As soon as I read that to my husband, I went, wait a minute, I was just over on Drudge. And I went back and I checked CNN, ABC, NBC, every news 
and Drudge, because he kind of covers everything, and not one word was said in one American newspaper. They were talking about Kim Kardashian or some nonsense. Uh-huh. And I'm like, this is important news. A biological, a chemical, and a nuclear attack in six of our cities is major news. And not one person was saying it. And I was like, wild. I got home about maybe six or eight hours later, went to my laptop, and I went, went to pull that back up, and it was scrubbed. Oh, and I yeah. told my husband, this was a message to people who know what's coming, just like the Odigo text message was. Don't go. They didn't tell them they were going to blow up the towers. They just said, don't go to work in the towers today. Don't go anywhere near the towers today, I, I suppose. They might have said in their text message to those Jews. Yeah, yeah. Well, they you didn't know, I go. guess we, we could maybe sign up for Odigo text services. And find I, think it's, I think it's a good <laughs> idea. Jeez. I mean, I'm just blown away. So that's why I decided I better talk about that because I know you have a pretty good sized audience. And I think the only way we can stop this, because we know this, and we've talked about it earlier, the Israelis monitor social media. And if you are out on social media, you oh. need to be repeating that they have a false flag planned again. They were behind 9-11. And get it out there. Shine that light on those cockroaches so they don't do this. It's our only hope right now. It is possible to stop them if enough people know and yes. begin to talk about it on the social media. That's a very good exactly. point. Very important. They, monitor, they definitely monitor. And if you don't believe me, just type in Israel in the search bar on Facebook and or Mossad, and it takes you to a page. And so you tag them whenever you say Israel or Mossad in your conversation on Facebook. It goes right to this so they know who very you are. Very smart. The thing that bothers me, Rebecca, is they're so arrogant anymore they, they just don't care they own the media you go all the way back to operation northwoods in the 1950s when the cia cia whatever uh and whoever their friends were back then of course we know who their friends are now they're controlling friends they said they could put a, a major story any story they want in any major newspaper in america within minutes if they wanted to that there was a brag they mm-hmm. bragged and that's true now that's in the 50s can you folks imagine the control they have now? How many people you watch on TV? Not necessarily all of them, but how many you watch on TV that are actually employed by the enemy of humanity that are right there in your face and that you learn to trust? My God, it's... Uh... Somewhere in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they got kind of busted because three of those guys showed up alive. And of course, now it's really interesting because... That story I told when I was uh, doing my first interviews with Methodical Illusion. And um, there was a guy who was an employee at the FAA, and he's kind of like, you know, office geek kind of guy, mm-hmm. you know, one of those go getters. And when he heard the names, uh, the list of the names that the television put out, he started running him through the FAA lists and found the uh, Adnan Bukhari was his name as an employee of the FAA. So he went to his supervisor and he told his supervisor, wait, 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 he's one of us. He's, he's an employee. He's a flight safety instructor down in at a Saratoga Springs, someplace in Florida. Right. And I just don't remember the, the town. It doesn't really matter. And uh, he got fired. That guy, the office guy, got fired for pointing this out to his supervisors, and his family contacted me from hearing hmm. a Coast to Coast or some radio show that I did and mm-hmm. mentioned uh, the, that one of these guys was an FAA employee, and he'd found, actually been found out about, and when that guy turned, it, turned in the information that, hey, wait a minute, he's an employee, mm-hmm. and he's a flight instructor down in Florida, and he's still alive, and the guy shows up alive, that guy got fired. Okay, so here's what happened to him. He eventually fought and got his job back. It took a, a month or three or something. And stepping off a bus in Washington, D.C., uh-uh. hit black SUV in a hit and run. Yeah. That's the FAA employee that, you know, yeah. did the due diligence looking in the list. Yeah, you know, simple. He thought he was going to find them on the no-fly list, but ah. he didn't. Well, and so he was just a go-getter. <laughs> yeah, his heart was in the right well, place. Well, too bad. <laughs> uh, he's gone, and uh, he tried, and that's all we can do. You uh, had any threats? Any uh, hassles? No, not, not like you've had. <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, I've, it's, it's been interesting because um, of 
people that are supposedly in, in this truth movement, mm-hmm. uh, some have been a little bit uh, a nasty, or we don't think you ever flew. Well, you know, I have a whole jewelry box of wings, <laughs> a collection over 30 years, a couple hats. Um, but at the same time, since you understand this, because you did have a death uh, experience from them, um, I do keep myself on the move, and I have... Uh, set myself up before you see i wrote the book two years before it came published because i really thought i'd be a drone strike uh to when i found out what i did where the planes were taken and how uh-huh, it was done uh-huh. it was being hit, and then i traced all of those connections and then i continued tracing those connections into the second book and um so i had to i set myself up with uh several places to go that are out, out of the way I, <laughs> well smart <laughs> these these people are was come through the door and sometimes hand me their seat number and say, if anybody gives you any any guff, <laughs> I'll kick their butt. Let me know. Really? Jay. Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. That was so yeah. common. And I, I oftentimes would, at the end of my trip on my layover, I was thinking, well, why didn't that happen on 9-11? I, I'm, because these men, you know, basically said, well, hey, I'll, I'll you know, I'll just get it up and, and take them down. And that's what happens nowadays, right? So... As I'm looking at the people who made phone calls and stuff, the things that just amazed me is that Flight 11, for example, lo and behold, they had a Hollywood producer. They had, I don't know, four or five Raytheon electronic warfare specialists. Uh-huh. On. Uh-huh. There was a retired astronaut who worked for the BAE systems. Huh. And so we went over that last time, the BAE yeah, systems. Yeah. And um, there was a highly trained assassin on board. There was a linebacker, mm-hmm. a guy, a 25-year-old uh, football star. Uh, he also played uh, varsity basketball, not a little guy. There were super athletes on board that boxers, linebackers, uh, you know, athletic people. Right. And two professional hockey players. And I'll never forget the first charter I did of a hockey team. I almost quit flying. Ah. <laughs> Those guys are mean, and they're tough. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm looking at this, and there's at least a dozen men right there mm-hmm. that were over six foot, and they were athletic and strong and would have kicked butt, just like all those guys came on and told me, if the scenario were what it was. I mean, look at that list. A Hollywood producer and a trained assassin. We could make a movie here. And I Easy. think that's that's what they were doing. And, you know, one of the things I told my husband when I put it all together is if they would have asked a flight attendant uh, to be a, you know, like in the movie, they have a consultant. Uh-huh. If they would have asked a flight attendant to be a consultant on this uh, B movie they put together called 9-11. Yeah. They wouldn't have got caught. But you see, it's the, it's you, doing things like having flight attendants call their mom and dad or calling their husband. You would not do that. You would call crew scheduling or a company security number, usually crew scheduling, because that number you know by heart. And they they have the button, so they can call. They can literally click on and pull in the security of corporate security and the FAA all at once. So there are places where we would have called, and I none of the flight attendants did that. And so that's why I said, well, even Betty Young said, I don't know. I don't know. We might be being hijacked. I don't know. Well, you know if you're being hijacked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you sure, sure and do. So, it was really interesting. Another thing, people well, was this asked, a case of voice modulation? No, they were really there. They were mm-hmm. really on a phone, uh, probably in an office in the hangar. I'm uh-huh. gonna guess. Um, yeah. yeah. Although maybe some of them use their cell phone. I mean, Amy Sweeney's boss, her, her supervisor was a uh, dust, unless some was in there. That's right. Uh, so it, the, I'm sure that they used multiple ways. Now, I, I know about some new laser weapons, and these are now weapons that are public knowledge. Now, you can go in and look and see how they've got some planes. Uh, well, the Air Force is going to put laser weapons on their uh, jet fighters by the year 2020. So in five years, they'll be standard equipment. They have them on some of the other aircraft Correct. right now already, yeah. and some ground units as well. Mm-hmm. The technology in the Navy ships, weapons. you bet. We're 50, 50 years behind what the research and development is. Old cliche, but never more true. At least 50 in some and cases. So one of the things that as I continue digging into these companies and how they're all related uh, is I keep finding that um, all of these, the military industrial complex now includes companies that are involved with uh, IT, Internet technology, mm-hmm. artificial intelligence, uh, computer uh, and telephone communications, all communications, and biotech companies. And the biotech companies 
are often involved with uh, neurological uh, things, or our nerves. And so I, I'm feeling, my gut feeling, if you want to ask my gut, uh, is that this whole military-industrial complex is somehow wrapped up in the chem trailing that we see. Because there's, that's a, there's a, a major connection. I don't know what it is, and I've been watching them since 1995, mm-hmm. 96. Uh, yes, agreed. I, I believe, I mean, if it were something that were killing us, now it may be killing us slowly, but if it were something killing us, we'd see the death rate increase, and we haven't. So I'm, be, I'm leaning toward uh, this being something uh, to help uh, in the space war. This space war is real, and it's <laughs> those things are really out there. The weapons that they have in the, the space war category, and you can I mean, just Google search some of this stuff. Yeah. That's kind of what I do to find stuff, and then I just dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And But I'm finding that the, I think that's where the trail's going. It's really interesting because after I did Methodical Illusion, I wasn't planning on doing a sequel because I didn't know I was going to get all this eyewitnesses and all these people and and I've had people from the military base that told me they were locked out the base had been evacuated and they were locked out for two or three days Hmm. and that was my first indicator that boy was I right on and that's exactly where the planes were taken because the phone calls work and so then I started to see that this was kind of a movie and interesting thing as I was looking and I'm I'm thinking you know I remember right after 9-11 when I went back to work every man just about every guy that, that was, certainly anyone that was a military, firefighter, cop, or sometimes just a big old guy, six foot one, 200 pounder, was come through the door and sometimes hand me their seat number and say, if anybody gives you any, any guff, <laughs> I'll kick their butt. Let me know. Really? Jay. Oh, yeah. Sure. Said, sure. Oh, sure. Sure. We can call the pilots. We can call, we can make a PA announcement that'll go off in the cockpit uh-huh. and the cabin or in different parts of the aircraft. He would know how the doors work. He would know where cockpit keys are kept. He would know how strong a cockpit door was if he needed to kick it in. All of those things because he's a hostage rescue specialist and an so anti. It, too bad he wasn't on board MH370. <laughs> He may have been. <laughs> Ooh, this we don't, because <laughs> we don't know what happened to that plane, no, do we? we? Don't. No. It's a similar story than what happened to this one, because you see, when the flight termination system takes over an aircraft remotely, which they did uh, on all four aircraft, they lose. It operates on the same frequency as the airplane's transponder. Okay. The transponder tells the air traffic controller your altitude, the airline you are, the type of aircraft you are, your speed, and things like that. So the minute the flight termination system takes over, boom, you disappear from radar. And they did. So they could have landed them anywhere. And they did. They landed Didn't they them land in Cleveland, one of them? No, they all went to one Air Force base in the Western. Air Force base. Mm-hmm. Okay, so all four planes went into a hangar, so they weren't visible. They had hangars that that facilitate C five transport planes, which are bigger oh, okay. than. Oh, uh, They can all go in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They have six of them though, so they could each have their own. All these people that were then executed somehow. I, I believe they were, and now after Methodical Illusion came out, oh, uh, hordes of pilots and flight attendants have come on and said, you have figured this out. This is exactly what happened. And what we think collectively, and we mm. can only guess, yeah. is that the handlers on board, because there were not hijackers, but there were handlers, much like 9B on Flight 11. Sure. And, um, more than likely, they had guns. And that we think they probably told the crew that they were part of one of those ongoing war games going on and testing the NORAD response system. Sure. And once they got them on the ground, the first three aircraft, two people were removed. Flight 11, two flight attendants were removed, and they were taken upstairs, just like Betty Ong said. He stood upstairs. That's where they were, in a hangar. And upstairs on the hangars are office office space. And that's why the, uh, Betty Ong and Amy Sweeney were telling two different stories. They were telling totally opposite details of what was supposedly going on 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 board because they didn't know what what was really supposed to be going on. They didn't know the story. They hadn't been briefed well enough, and they were, you know, nervous and not knowing what what the other one was saying. And again, that was a red flag for me because when you're in a hijacking, the most important thing is all communication is what it is. It's not different. It has to be the same. So if you're giving your location, like you're sitting at your jump seat at 3R, if the uh, uh, hostage rescue people want to come through the back door, they'd want you to move or you're going to have broken knees. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is... Uh... The first class. Uh, usually the most senior person is first class. So 
Um, all so of he, the he, he did fly first class all the time. Business, yeah, and first class. See, if you're a uh, executive platinum, you get uh, free upgrades. Got it. <laughs> okay. All right. Stand by, Rebecca, just for a couple. I'll take a little break. We'll come right back. Talking with Rebecca Roth, just uh, a stunning breakthrough in the whole 9 11 story. Back in a minute. Okay, and we're back. Uh, grateful to have Rebecca Roth back with us again. She is a very friendly person, as you might expect from her career, as a uh, friendly person working as a purser and flight attendant on uh, national and international flights. The idea of a fraternity, sorority, uh, a family is very interesting, what you must have heard from other people. Have you heard anything from other stewardesses and pilots which have sharpened your research, opened other no doors or, or areas to explore? Uh, no, I don't think so, other than the fact that Mohammed Atta was a million-mile passenger because, you know, the court... You didn't know that in the beginning? That came later? Uh, uh, after Methodical Illusion came out, I uh, was given that information by a flight attendant. Uh-huh. Uh, that, you know, that gal that was stuck in Tokyo, she was, uh, they, everybody was so amazed. Because here's the thing. Remember the official story of 9-11? That Mohammed Atta had gone to Portland, Maine, and he came back to Boston, which is like 15 minutes to spare. I mean, he had a really tight connection, uh -huh. maybe 20 minutes. You'll remember this part of the story. And, and the FBI told us that Mohammed Atta had rented a car, and then he uh, rented another car and left one of them at the Boston uh, parking with, with lot the and Koran in the back. Yeah, and not only that, but when he made that tight connection, because he flew back in from, and that's where they claim they have him on security tape, but you can't tell who he really is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so here's the thing: if he's a, a a platinum executive, platinum million mile passenger, as part of that status, you get a luggage tag that uh, guarantees that piece of luggage will be put on your flight. Period. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. But you'll remember. His luggage didn't make a flight, and that's how someone down there on the ramp, right. American, found his luggage with his will, testament, and manuals for flying airplanes and Korans and all that stuff. Uh, some of it they found in his car, but they also found his luggage that didn't make the connect. That is, my friend, impossible for an executive million-mile passenger, because you get like a brass luggage tag, and we know what it looks like, so if we see it, we know. Back to hour number three. It was... Uh... Quite a good first two hours. 9-11 is today. We're going to talk to a young woman who has not been on this program before. She has done an extraordinary amount of research, however, and I assume she's standing by there. Rebecca, are you there? I am, yes, I am. Where are you? You don't have to tell me the town. What, what state are you in? What part of the country? I'm in the, the western part of the United States. Good. Right that narrowed it right down. I like that. <laughs> All right. Rebecca Roth is our guest, and uh, I've subtitled it 9-11 Whodunit. Rebecca has done some extraordinary work, and I want her just to kind of jump into that, and, and we'll follow along and, and chime in here and there and ask her to amplify and, and further elucidate on things. But what got you pulled into this? Uh, you know, I uh, stopped flying in about 2004, and you I were really a, a hostess. Yes, I was. I was an international purser and a flight attendant for about 30 years at the time of 9/11. Wow. Um, I flew until about 2004, and then I never really looked back at the airline or 9/11 or anything else. I uh -huh. saw it unfold on television, just like everyone else did. Yeah. And um, in 2008, eight nine, somewhere in there, in my retirement, I thought, well, I'll just write that novel everyone I flew with told me I should write. So I started to write a novel just about life in the jet stream and what it was like to do what I did for a living. And I traveled and I saw lots of great places, met lots of neat people all around the world. Uh -huh. I thought, well, this would be really kind of fun to base a novel on. And then um, about, I don't know, chapter two or three into my novel, I decided I'd I'd introduce a Middle Eastern character 
and I wanted to grab a name. So I Google searched 19 Arab hijackers from 9-11. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, up in front of me came a BBC article written September 23rd, 2001. How did I miss this? Six of the hijackers were still alive. At least four of them were professional airline pilots out of the Middle East. And I was just absolutely shocked. Cause yeah, I, that, aren't there more still alive? I think, there's uh, actually ten. Ten, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that, they, yeah, that, I can see how that knocked you over, sure. <laughs> it sure did. And I, I was like, I was so shocked. And then I, I read a little bit about these, uh, you know, hijackers still alive. I started Googling, mm-hmm. and started looking, and then I started discovering other things. I set that novel aside and did thousands of hours of research into 9-11 because I have to honestly tell you, even though I never looked back and I couldn't really go there uh, mentally. Right. I knew from day one that cell phone calls cannot be made from altitude. And when I started hearing that, and I started hearing that the flight attendants themselves were making cell phone calls, and um, in 2008, nine, somewhere in there, in my retirement, I thought, well, I'll just write that novel everyone I flew with told me I should write. So I started to write a novel just about life in the jet stream and what it was like to do what I did for a living and I traveled, and I saw lots of great places, met lots of neat people all around the world. Uh-huh. I thought, well, this would be really kind of fun to base a novel on. And then um, about, I don't know, chapter two or three into my novel, I decided I'd, I'd introduce a Middle Eastern character, and I wanted to grab a name. So I Google searched 19 Arab hijackers from 9-11. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, up in front of me came a BBC article written September 23rd, 2001. How did I miss this? Six of the hijackers were still alive. At least four of them were professional airline pilots out of the Middle East. And I was just absolutely shocked. Cause yeah, I, that, aren't there more still alive? I think there's uh, actually 10. 10, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that, then, yeah, that, I can see how that knocked you over, sure. <laughs> it sure did. And I, I was like, I was so shocked. And then I I read a little bit about these, uh, you know, hijackers still alive. I started Googling, mm-hmm. and started looking, and then I started discovering other things. I set that novel aside and did thousands of hours of research into 9-11 because I have to honestly tell you, even though I never looked back and I couldn't really go there uh, mentally. Right. I knew from day one that cell phone calls cannot be made from altitude. And when I started hearing that, and I started hearing that the flight attendants themselves were making cell phone calls, uh-huh. reservations and you, different you family, yeah. I knew that was wrong. It's not yeah. protocol. Yeah. And it can't happen. And then I, I saw and heard so many things that were wrong that my I just put my brain on uh, don't go there. Look, I'm not going to go there. Because I flew for a few years after that. And listen, when you're flying, your safety net is NORAD and the U.S. military. And I've had jets scrambled for me before for different incidences over my career. Huh. And they come to your wingtips, and it's very frightening because sometimes you can see their arms, armament hanging from them. And uh, they'll maybe shoot you down. You just don't know. But the feeling is horrible, except they do scramble and come to, to your rescue in six minutes. On that day, it took almost two hours. And... After Whoops, nine, something wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, my first question was, um, well, when somebody called me and said, turn your television on right now, and I'd just gotten home from Europe, and I'd, I'd come in as a purser, so mm-hmm. I hadn't seen any FAA uh, warnings about hijackers or anything, or Al-Qaeda, and we'd never been told about uh, Tim Osman, I mean, uh, Osama bin Laden. Tim or, Osman, yes. <laughs> or I later on found out he was a CIA asset in the yeah. mid-80s. To start yeah. up the Mujahideen for the CIA. And so I, I didn't... Hours. 9-11 is today. We're going to talk to a young woman who has not been on this program before. She has done an extraordinary amount of research, however, and I assume she's standing by there. Rebecca, are you there? I am, yes, I am. Where are you? Don't have to tell me the town. What, what state are you in? What part of the country? I'm in the, the western part of the United States. Good. Right that narrowed it right down. I like that. <laughs> All right. Rebecca Roth is our guest, and uh, I've subtitled it 9-11 Who Done It. Rebecca has done some extraordinary work, and I want her just to kind of jump into that, and, and we'll follow along and, and chime in here and there and ask her to amplify and, and further elucidate on things, but... What got you pulled into this? 
Uh, you know, I uh, stopped flying in about 2004, and you I were really a, a hostess. Yes, I was. I was an international purser and a flight attendant for about 30 years at the time of 9/11. Wow. Um, I flew until about 2004, and then I never really looked back at the airline or 9/11 or anything else. I uh-huh. saw it all unfold on television, just like everyone else did. Yeah. And um, in 2008, nine, somewhere in there, in my retirement, I thought, well, I'll just write that novel everyone I flew with told me I should write. So I started to write a novel just about life in the jet stream and what it was like to do what I did for a living. And I traveled and I saw lots of great places, met lots of neat people all around the world. Uh-huh. I thought, well, this would be really kind of fun to base a novel on. And then um, about, I don't know, chapter two or three into my novel, I decided I'd I'd introduce a Middle Eastern character, and I wanted to grab a name. So I Google searched 19 Arab hijackers from 9-11. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, up in front of me came a BBC article written September 23, 2001. How did I miss this? Six of the hijackers were still alive. At least four of them were professional airline pilots out of the Middle East. And I was just absolutely shocked. Cause yeah, I, that, aren't there more still alive? I think there's actually uh, ten. Ten, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, they, yeah that, I can see how that knocked you over, sure. <laughs> it sure did. And I, I was like, I was so shocked. And then I I read a little bit about these, uh, you know, hijackers still alive. I started Googling, mm-hmm. and started looking, and then I started discovering other things. I set that novel aside and did thousands of hours of research into 9-11 because I have to honestly tell you, even though I never looked back and I couldn't really go there uh, mentally. Right. I knew from day one that cell phone calls cannot be made from altitude. And when I started hearing that, and I started hearing that the flight attendants themselves were making cell phone calls, uh-huh. reservations and you, different you family, yeah. I knew that was wrong. I know them really, really well. She told me, and she was about a 30-year uh, flight attendant as well, and she just told me that all of the flight attendants there mostly were senior enough to hold international, and so they were 20 to 30-year people. So that means if you're flying domestic, which we do sometimes, uh, even the international people, we fly domestic trips for whatever reason. Sometimes we just want to bump up our hours or pick up an extra trip or just make an adjustment on our schedule, and we can fly domestic and international. Well, so if you're flying uh, domestic, and let's say you're going from Boston to Los Angeles, and Mr. Ada is on board, you would know him, and you would be the first class. Uh, usually, the most senior person is first class. So, um, all so of he, the he, he did fly first class all the time. Business, yeah, and first class. See, if you're uh, executive platinum, you get uh, free upgrades. Got it. <laughs> okay. All right. Stand by, Rebecca, just for a couple. I'll take a little break. We'll come right back. Talking with. Rebecca Roth, just uh, a stunning breakthrough in the whole 9-11 story. Back in a minute. Okay, and we're back. Uh, Grateful to have Rebecca Roth back with us again. She is a very friendly person, as you might expect from her career, as a uh, friendly person working as a purser and flight attendant on uh, national and international flights. The idea of a fraternity, sorority, uh, a family is very interesting, what you must have heard from other people. Have you heard anything from other stewardesses and pilots which have sharpened your research, opened other no- doors or, or areas to explore? Uh, no, I don't think so, other than the fact that Mohammed Atta was a million-mile passenger, because, you know, that according You didn't to the know first, that in the beginning? That came later? Uh, after Methodical Illusion came out, I uh, was given that information by a flight attendant. Uh-huh. Uh, that, you know, that gal that was stuck in Tokyo, she was, uh, they, everybody was so amazed. Because here's the thing. Remember the official story of 9-11? that Mohammed Atta had gone to Portland, Maine, and he came back to Boston with just like 15 minutes to spare. I mean, he had a really tight connection, uh-huh. maybe 20 minutes. You'll remember this part of the story, and, and the FBI told us that Mohammed Atta had rented a car, and then he uh, rented another car and left one of them at the Boston uh, parking with, with lot. With the Koran in the back. 
Yeah, and not only that, but when he made that tight connection, because he flew back in from, and that's where they claim they have him on security tape, but you can't tell who he really is. Mm-hmm. And uh, so so here's the thing. If he's a, a, a platinum, executive platinum, million-mile passenger, just the side story about him and his luggage not making the flight, which is impossible for him now mm-hmm. that we know he's a million-mile passenger. But also... His father was contacted by a, a reporter from the, I can't remember now, if it was the Telegraph, one of the newspapers out of the UK on the 12th of September. And because by then they were, you know, spouting his name around the world. Mm-hmm. And his father said, well, no, he had talked to his son on the 12th earlier that day and he was happy and fine. Everything was great. And they asked him where he could, you know, can we find him? Do you know where he's at? And he said, if you want to know where my, my son is, You'll have to ask the Mossad because that's who he works for. And when I found that, I was oh, like, "Oh, very interesting." Uh, another connection that I found, and you know, like I said, you know, I dove into this thinking I was going to find 19 radical Muslims, but what I found was something totally different. Yeah, well, some of those people were, uh, as I believe, uh, very accomplished professionals in different fields. They weren't flakes. Um, it's been a while since I remember reading about them. There, some of them, if not most of them. Maybe even all of them are still alive. No? <laughs> well, you know, I found 10 of them are still alive. And then uh-huh. I've, uh, I've read so some people from the intelligence world think that uh, just like I was going to do when I Google searched their names, uh, I was going to create a character for a novel completely uh, fictional. <laughs> right. And so they may not even have been. And if you look at a list of the names of the supposed 19 hijackers, a lot of them, like two or three of them, all have the same last name. Uh, but, you yeah. know, originally the FBI mm-hmm. also, um, of that 19, there there were four different names originally in the first uh, 72 hours or so. They kind of changed it without making much of a fanfare. Although you can find a, a correction uh, by CNN because CNN reported those other four names and then they did a withdrawal or, or correction later on, but they didn't make a big deal of Like I said, I didn't know it until I was doing this, but the three of those people they claimed were on the passenger manifest, quote, from the FBI were still alive and showed up. One of them was an FAA flight instructor. His last, he happened to have a, a Islamic or a, a Muslim last name. No or kidding. Saudi and there was another oh. gentleman claimed was the uh, the fourth one, and he'd been dead for a year since September 11th, 2000. He mm-hmm. died in a small plane crash outside of, somewhere in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they got kind of busted because three of those guys showed up alive. And, of course, now it's really interesting because that story I told when I was uh, doing my first interviews with Methodical Illusion, and um, there was a guy who was an employee at the FAA, and he's kind of like, you know, office geek kind of guy, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, one of those go-getters. And when he heard the names, uh, the list of the names that the television put out, he started running him through the FAA list and found the all of those people that were signers, these people planned for a quote-unquote new Pearl Harbor that was necessary to rally the sheep behind that red, white, and blue flag and go bomb the hell out of the Middle East. And we've done that for 14 years. Our country's broke, and we're still going in and trying to bomb Syria, and we have our eyes set on, well, we don't, but Israel has their heart set on well, us going uh, wrong. Well, my, my man of the year, maybe man of the decade, Vladimir Putin, uh, has said we are not going to allow Syria to fall. And that has really shaken the pentagram. I call it the pentagram. Uh, it has shaken those people up. They don't like that. He's, he is a man not to be trifled with yes. at all. He's a very smart man. Uh, and I heard someone on, on a, where was it? So, I, anyway, saying that he, they wish that he was our president, uh, that Russia in many ways has become what America used to be. Uh, it's very interesting. Now, that may be a distorted perception, but that's the kind of thing that's being thought by people. The Samson option, for those of you who don't know, is the name that many military analysts and authors have given to Israel's deterrence strategy, i.e. thermonuclear deterrence, of massive retaliation with nuclear weapons as a, quote, last resort <clears throat> if military attacks threaten its existence. In other words, if they feel they're about to be wiped out, they can take out any capital city basically in the world. They're that, they're that advanced. They have ICBMs. They have cruise 
missiles that can be launched from submarines, uh, aircraft. They, they've got it all, thanks to us. Commentators have also employed the term to refer to situations where non-nuclear, non-Israeli actors have threatened conventional weapons retaliation. Two examples have been given, Yasser Arafat and Hezbollah. Uh, it goes on. You can look it up, uh, Wikipedia, anywhere. But they have plans, folks, to take... And I've said, I, I, Rebecca, I said this, I'll bet I said this 20 years ago, if it was yesterday. The controllers will take it all down in flames rather than give up their control. They don't give a damn. They're not going to give up their control. So we're not going to outsmart them, outthink them, outlegislate them. They own it. They own the game now. Now, if we get on that, what she just said, if we make enough noise, we can potentially force them to change their plans, to delay, to stall, to reschedule, whatever. Otherwise, I think most of us know the next 9-11 event is going to be far worse, far more deadly, and Americans will literally come groveling to their, quote, government of career criminal politicians to protect them, of the sheeple, the people, who don't know any better and who don't really have the ability to stand back and stop reacting to things. They're not proactive anymore. And they have been taken to a place of near virtual control. Uh, this is not a game. It's not a joke. They're very, very good at this. It's, it's a science to them, and it's a piece of cake. Oh, definitely. And and that's one of the things I really wanted to bring out in the, the second book. The first book, I wanted you to see what happens when there's an event like 9-11, a crash or anything. And there's a couple fictitious uh, events, but I wanted people to understand how it affect, how it affects all flight attendants and pilots across the board and how we are united. And that's why I'm not being attacked by one single solitary uh, airline person that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. I, and I know that there's someone that runs a blog that said I was just trying to make money off of a book. Well, I think, have you ever written a book? There is no money in it. No. <laughs> so I'm putting my life on the line for $3 a copy or $2 <laughs> a book. I mean, it's hardly worth it. because No, I no, have no authors make money. Very, very few. And so, I mean, it's just nonsensical when I hear things like that. It's just really crazy. But for the second book, what I used was DEA documents, FBI, mm -hmm. FAA, NORAD, the United States Air Force, the National Transportation were these, State. Were these public released documents you just went through and uh, called yes. more information from? Yes. Gluing things together, connecting things? I'm a connector. You know, I, I think I told you this when we were talking on the phone. I studied organic chemistry and biochemistry in school. So hmm. you have to go into things on a molecular level. When you add molecules and you've got electrons and they're going to e either repel each other or <laughs> really like each other and become something else, you are, have that ability. And I think looking back now, that is one of the things that's helped me to dissect this uh, whole thing and connect all the dots, put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And um, also in, from the, the stuff from the Zachariah Masawi trial, because uh, it's been really interesting to see how the FBI changed documents. For example, in the Zachariah Masawi trial, they never mentioned Barbara Olson's phone calls. Really? They didn't exist. And I found that really oh, they interesting. They were one of the early highlights of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, and this is one of the things I did for my second book was I... I started following up each person that made the phone calls that, that were made so public to us. Uh -huh. um, and lo and behold, if I didn't connect most of them back to one source, I bet mm. you know where that is. You're kidding. <laughs> no. I mean, you know, I don't remember if we That's talked amazing. <laughs> about Barbara Olson on the air last time or not, but because I've just done so many interviews, but... I was so fascinated by the fact that she graduated from a like, two-year college in Texas, and then she went to Hollywood and went to work for HB. Or was. I hope they do. I go <laughs> let's ahead. Roll. He's the let's roll hero. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. There's another company they represent called Allied Materials, and Allied Materials bought a, a company called uh, Varian Semiconductors. They also bought two or uh, three Israeli companies, so they're very connected to Israel. So is Oracle. Through Larry Ellison. You bet. And I'm bet. finding the same uh, connection. And so far, almost all of the people that we were led to believe on Flight 93 were heroes, were connected to the military-industrial complex and or Israel or both. 
Wow. Uh, by the way, speaking of Israeli companies like Amdocs, very few people know that the, the ultra above top secret communications equipment from Air Force One uh, to the White House to the Pentagon and back and forth was installed by apparently no American company had the technical knowledge or expertise to do something like that. So they had to go to Israel to get an Israeli company to do it. And you wouldn't think, folks, would you, that they build a back door or two or ten into the system? Uh, there are no secrets to these people. It is often said, tongue-in-cheek, but I'm not sure how much, that the intel gathered by the NSA, etc., goes to Tel Aviv first, recorded, and then is dumped off in Utah. So I don't know the answers to this, but it stinks, all of it, and it always has. Remember, Zionism is a non-religious, a secular geopolitical movement for world domination. It has been in the works for hundreds of years. Nothing new. It's just something that people haven't been aware of. And you're right. They are waking up now. And this is scaring them. I'm sure it is. They don't like well, it. Well, in my first book, Methodical Illusion, I worked something in there. It was something that I'd really actually found. And again, I want to mention this in case I did last time. I want to still mention it again. Sure, go ahead. Reading through a brand new iPad and reading the news to my uh, husband as we were driving on the highway. It was a, I believe it came from a, a, a website called Ynet News out of Israel. Yep. They claimed, and now remember that the Israeli intelligence claimed that they knew 9-11 was going to happen too after it happened. They, they were That's bright. right. They did. So this is what struck me because this was about two and a half years ago maybe that I'm reading this. But it to me was a signal that there is, you know, people in the know, kind of like the Odigo text messaging that yeah. – that told people not to go into the World Trade Center towers. And only about, what, three or four or five Jews went to work that day. The, it was 12 or 1,400 didn't, something like that. I, I heard 4,000 got the text Was message. it 4,000? Wow. Yeah. And so I'm reading this, and here's how the article basically went. The Israeli intelligence had intercepted chatter and plans that the Al-Qaeda, now they've kind of been huh. Was yeah. planning to attack five or six major United States cities using. She went to Hollywood for a decade, you know, liberal Hollywood. She came out as a conservative, uh, uh, a pundit, I guess you call her. And uh -huh. uh, so she uh, she spends a decade in Hollywood, and you can't find any information with her. She was acting. She could have been doing commercials, taking acting lessons. We don't know. She worked for HBO and Stacy Keach Productions. Other than that, she could have been anything from an actress to a copy girl. There's just nothing out there uh -huh. about. But she spent 10 years in Hollywood, liberal Hollywood, and then she went to a Jewish law school called Yeshiva Law School, and it's I think the name of their law part is Ben Cordova Law School. She goes to law school, and she graduates and goes right to the top of the pig pile in Washington, D.C. It's joined... amazing how they fast-track their own. Jeez. Yeah, it's amazing. She goes into... <laughs> Uh, a law firm called Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering. Now, Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering, they have a really interesting background. Cutler was the White House counsel for Carter and Bill Clinton. I remember him. And part uh, another partner was C. Boyd and Gray. C. Boyd and Gray was the White House counsel for uh, George H.W. Bush when he was vice president and president. There's wow. another interesting partner at this law firm with Barbara Olson, mm -hmm. Jamie Gorlick, who sat on the 9-11 commission. -11 commission. There was somebody else who's really interesting, and I found that part of the cover-up was through the FBI. But the former FBI director, Robert Mueller, was also a partner in the same law firm as Barbara Olson. Oh, now, my. The this, FBI, is, this is wild. How do you <laughs> sleep at night with all this data? You, you've got it all. I'm constantly doing research, and it's much deeper than this. We could go on for three hours, I kid you not. So another well, person, I believe you who's interesting, that was in that same law firm, William Weld. He was the governor at Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and he also was the, the coach for George W. Bush for the debates against uh, John Kerry. He was his coach. Huh. I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Barbara Olson, she was right in there with some very interesting connected people to the CIA and the FBI. And so then I go to their client list, and lo and behold, fasten your seatbelt. Jeff Rance, you are never going to believe, in alphabetical order, who's at the top of the list. 9B, remember I told you the name? Yes, yes. Akamai Technologies is a client of Barbara Olson's law firm that she went oh, to. Work. All in the family. Not Unbelievable. Just, 
But it gets better going down the alphabetical list. Amdocs. Amdocs was. I know about Amdocs. (laughs) And they monitored every phone call. Yeah. In the United States, because they were part of billing systems. They do Uh, the billing, folks, for your cell phone, for your mm -hmm. most probably your landline, but all almost virtually all cell phones, all mobile phones, portable phones, smartphones, smart devices. Uh, As soon as I read that to my husband, I went, wait a minute, I was just over on Drudge. And I went back and I checked CNN, ABC, NBC, every news and Drudge, because he kind of covers everything, and not one word was said in one American newspaper. They were talking about Kim Kardashian or, or some nonsense. Uh-huh. And I'm like, this is important news. A biological, a chemical, and a nuclear attack in six of our cities is major news. And not one person was saying it. And I was like, wild. I got home about maybe six or eight hours later, went to my laptop, and I went, went to pull that back up, and it was scrubbed. Oh, and I yeah. told my husband, this was a message to people who know what's coming, just like the Odigo text message was. Don't go. They didn't tell them they were going to blow up the towers. They just said, don't go to work in the towers today. Don't go anywhere near the towers today, I, I suppose. They might have said in their text message to those Jews. Yeah, yeah. Well, they didn't go. You know, I go. guess we, we could maybe sign up for Odigo text services. And find I, out. Think it's, I think it's a good <laughs> idea. Jeez. I mean, I'm just blown away. So that's why I decided I better talk about that because I know you have a pretty good size audience. And I think the only way we can stop this, because we know this, we've talked about it earlier, the Israelis monitor social media. And if you are out on social media, you need to be repeating that they have a false flag planned again. They were behind 9-11 and get it out there. Shine that light on those cockroaches so they don't do this. It's our only hope right now. It is possible to stop them if enough people know and begin to talk about it on the social media. That's a very good point. Very important. They they definitely monitor. And if you don't believe me, just type in Israel in the search bar on Facebook and or Mossad, and it takes you to a page. And so you tag them whenever you say Israel or Mossad in your conversation on Facebook. It goes right to this so they know who you are. Very smart. The thing that bothers me, Rebecca, is they're so arrogant anymore they, they just don't care they own the media if you go all the way back to operation northwoods in the 1950s when the cia cia whatever uh and whoever their friends were back then of course we know who their friends are now they're controlling friends they said they could put a, a major story any story they want in any major newspaper in america within minutes if they wanted to that there was a brag they mm-hmm. bragged and that's true now that's in the 50s can you folks imagine the control they have now? How many people you watch on TV? Not necessarily all of them, but how many you watch on TV that are actually employed by the enemy of humanity that are right there in your face and that you learn to trust? My God, it's, uh, it, I got out after 12 years and I, I could see where it was going. And it made me sick. I wanted nothing to do with it. The Samson you know, option. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, a lot of people ask me, was this what it was like to do what I did for a living? And I traveled and I saw lots of great places, met lots of neat people all around the world. Uh-huh. I thought, well, this would be really kind of fun to base a novel on. And then um, about, I don't know, chapter two or three into my novel, I decided I'd, I'd introduce a Middle Eastern character. And I wanted to grab a name. So I Google searched 19 Arab hijackers from 9-11. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, up in front of me came a BBC article written September 23rd, 2001. How did I miss this? Six of the hijackers were still alive. At least four of them were professional airline pilots out of the Middle East. And I was just absolutely shocked. Cause yeah, I, that, aren't there more still alive? I think, there's uh, actually ten. Ten, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, and that, then, yeah, that, I can see how that knocked you over, sure. <laughs> it sure did. And I, I was like, I was so shocked. And then I I read a little bit about these, uh, you know, hijackers still alive. I started Googling, mm-hmm. and started looking, and then I started discovering other things. I set that novel aside and did thousands of hours of research into 9-11. Because I have to honestly tell you, even though I never looked back and I couldn't really go there uh, mentally. Right. I knew from day one that cell phone calls cannot be made from altitude. And when I started hearing that, and I started hearing that the flight attendants themselves were making cell phone calls, Uh reservations, and different family, 
I knew that was wrong. It's not yeah. protocol. Yeah. And it can't happen. And then I, I saw and heard so many things that were wrong that my I just put my brain on uh, don't go there. Look, I'm not going to go there. Because I flew for a few years after that. And listen, when you're flying, your safety net is NORAD and the U.S. military. And I've had jets scrambled for me before for different incidences over my career. Huh. And they come to your wingtips, and it's very frightening because sometimes you can see their arms, armament hanging from them. And uh, they'll maybe shoot you down. You just don't know. But the feeling is horrible, except they do scramble and come to, to your rescue in six minutes. On that day, it took almost two hours. And... After Oops, nine, something wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, my first question was, um, well, when somebody called me and said, turn your television on right now, and I'd just gotten home from Europe, and I'd, I'd come in as a purser, so mm-hmm. I hadn't seen any FAA uh, warnings about hijackers or anything, or Al-Qaeda, and we'd never been told about uh, Tim Osman, I mean, uh, Osama bin Laden. Tim or, Osman, yes. <laughs> or I later on found out he was a CIA asset in the yeah. mid-80s. To start up the Mujahideen for the CIA. And so I I didn't know about him or um, Osama bin Laden or Al-Qaeda. They had never told us or warned us that this could be possible, a hijacking group. Mm -hmm. And I was was so shocked. I saw that second plane go into the South Tower. What they did to the people. Well, you know how they love to give you a little hint. They probably gassed them. Yep. They used something much more lethal than mace or pepper spray. Oh, yeah. And it was quick. And I'm. we think that the crew were probably told they were part of a drill. So when they removed those two people to make the phone calls on the mm-hmm. first jets, they mm-hmm. tossed in a canister of something. Now, we train with uh, those things. We train with uh, smoke bombs like that for uh, uh, simulating a smoke-filled cabin in our yearly training. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't be until a flight attendant or, or someone mm-hmm. realized that that uh, was cyanide gas or something that they couldn't move? They couldn't. They didn't have the strength to open the door, and if they did, they just fell out. That's kind of what we think. I mean, that's well. We there are a lot of nerve gases which dissipate fairly quickly. I'm told uh, they would have had to ev- certainly evacuate that hangar of uh, living people uh, mm-hmm. and then take the bodies out. Easily, just, they could have tracked a trailer and gotten rid of all of them. How many bodies were there all together? We there was figure? about 260. And mm-hmm. one of the things that um, people ask me is, how, how come the loads were so light? Because each cr- aircraft held around 200, give or yeah. take one. And um, the reason is, is because that there was a group of Israeli spies in this country. Sure. Uh, parading around as art students. Oh, good, uh, the art students, and, yeah. Uh, were um, also connected to a company called NICE, N-I-C-E, all capital letters. Mm -hmm. They are a company that was started from seven veterans from the Signal Intelligence Unit of the Israeli Mossad, Uh and they started NICE, and it's a surveillance company. They actually are surveilling all of Glasgow, Scotland, right now under camera and audio. And so they were a specialist in uh, taping or tapping phone and computer systems. So now there's lots of evidence that the phone lines were tapped for United and American. And so I'm assuming there they also took their made it so that there were very very light loads so they only had 260 people to get rid of. Unreal. Yeah. Just amazing what you've done. Amazing. Uh stand by we do have to take this break. We'll come right back in another segment to go with Rebecca Roth. This is stunning. You've, you've figured it out. You've done it. This is stunning. Back in a minute. Okay, so in all likelihood, they just put the passengers in their planes, gassed them, uh, remove the corpses after they... Uh, for making cell phone calls, uh-huh. reservations, and you, different you family. Yeah. I knew that was wrong. It's not yeah. protocol. Yeah. And it can't happen. And then I, I saw and heard so many things that were wrong that my I just put my brain on, uh, don't go there. Look, I'm not going to go there. Because I flew for a few years after that. And listen, when you're flying... 
your safety net is NORAD and the U.S. military. And I've had jets scrambled for me before for different incidences over my career. Huh. And they come to your wingtips, and it's very frightening because sometimes you can see their arms, armament hanging from them. And uh, they'll maybe shoot you down. You just don't know. But the feeling is horrible, except they do scramble and come to, to your rescue in six minutes. On that day, it took almost two hours. And... After Whoops, nine, something wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, my first question was, um, well, when somebody called me and said, turn your television on right now, and I'd just gotten home from Europe, and I'd, I'd come in as a purser, so mm-hmm. I hadn't seen any FAA uh, warnings about hijackers or anything, or Al-Qaeda, and we'd never been told about uh, Tim Osman, I mean, uh, Osama bin Laden. Tim or, Osman, yes. <laughs> or I, I later on found out he was a CIA asset in the yeah. mid-80s. To start up the Mujahideen for the CIA. And so I I didn't know about him or um, Osama bin Laden or Al-Qaeda. They had never told us or warned us that this could be possible, a hijacking group. Mm -hmm. And I was was so shocked. I saw that second plane go into the South Tower like a hot knife through butter. And honestly, I thought it was either trick photography or a new rendition of War War of the Worlds. Wow. I thought it was somebody was joking because mm-hmm. planes cannot disappear into a steel building. They're made of aluminum. And if you've ever seen an aircraft that's been in a real major hailstorm or hit by a large bird, they do a lot of damage. Those, those planes are very fragile. I've seen them take a bird strike and a lightning mm-hmm. strike and, mm-hmm. and see what happens. So mm-hmm. I, I really thought it was some kind of trick photography, and I, I really I had jet lag, and I didn't know what was going on. And the person on the other end of the phone was saying, it's terrorists. And I'm like, well, you know, later on that day, I said, well, how did they get control of NORAD? <laughs> how did they control our military? That was my main question, is so how could somebody on a, you know, the laptop and a satellite phone right. stop NORAD from scrambling? And uh, how, how many hours? Well, they were an hour and 45 minutes, I believe. My goodness. Close to yeah. New York. Yeah, yeah. But it's really interesting what happened. Well, then we get the story about, uh, who was it, Leon Panetta? I can't remember now. About Dick Cheney being told. Yeah, and that was Norman Mineta. Norman Mineta, not Leon Panetta. Yeah, see, with six, <clears throat> kind of yeah. like they could be a part of the same one. Um, well, first off, it was really chaotic because the government quickly as quickly as they as they could wanted to make it look like to the to the people the traveling public that we had all this security so they hired college kids Mm-hmm. And they hired people with no security background, and they set up tables. You might remember this. I mean, anybody that flew during that time will remember this. They put up, like, tables you would buy at Costco or put up for a picnic or, you mm-hmm. know, uh, mm-hmm. your office. Yeah. Um, Six-foot foot banquet, folding uh, banquet table, they call them. Uh, and they would go through all of our things, the flight crew. Uh-huh. and. They would show the passengers, we're we're so serious about this, look at what we're doing to the flight crew. But yet they wouldn't go through... And these are uh, untrained college kids? Yes. Okay. Yes, and then they hired them. uh, At first we had, as security, was all college kids uh, Mm -hmm. or kids off the street. I don't know where they got them, but young kids. And they would go through and check the seat back pockets, you know, in front of you where the magazines are. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were supposed to go through and check everything and make sure that there was nothing left on board once the airplane landed before we boarded again. Mm -hmm. Well, we would get on and do the same thing, and we found all kinds, CD players, radios, you name it. I mean, they weren't any good. But they they were scrambling to make it look to the traveling public. Okay, that raises the the question then. Were these ringers, were they hired uh, to look and act like they were doing a good job? When in point of fact, you just mentioned and made it clear that they weren't. They weren't doing their job. And I would think that after 9-11, they would take it seriously. You would think so. But, you know, one of the things I put in, I'm I'm sorry, I haven't mailed you your books yet because I I can't. Well, it's okay. You're just a little busy. I understand. (laughs) It's crazy. Um, Yes, and I I used a friend's boutique publishing company. I'm not self-published, but, you know, kind of. A friend had done this, and I said, please do let me do autograph books. And I, I, I swore only 20 people will buy this book. <laughs> we sent, I mean, I can't tell you, we're sending out hundreds every day. Well, congratulations. <laughs> then, that's, that's good. No matter what, that's wonderful that people care enough to buy this book and actually do the reading. That's, it's, uh, that's, it, that's it's, encouraging. What's happening, and I, you know, 
my goal and my mission was not to address people who had been doing this for decades, although I have had lots of email from people that said, man, I've been looking at this since the day it started, and you have opened my eyes to a whole new horizon. Mm -hmm. Because I'm bringing inside uh, perspective, mm -hmm. and so I looked at it and I heard what the flight attendants and the passengers were saying with a flight attendant ear. And so that's something you can't, I can't give you, <laughs> I wish. But, um, I, you know, it's just something I, I know the training, I know what we should have done. Right. I have also been contacted by numerous, you know, on and said, okay, I'm going in there with them. And I listened to every word. And Betty Ong called reservations, which is a line no flight attendant would call, because you're on hold, just like you guys are, just like passengers, 10, 15, sure minutes on hold. Mm -hmm. And if you're calling in in a real emergency, like a hijacking, you can't be on the phone for a long period of time because if a real hijacker saw you on the phone, they'd probably you're toast. Kill you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was not part of the protocol was to make phone calls outside. But we had two flight attendants that did that. One used a cell phone and one used an onboard phone. And Betty on called reservations and she said, one hijacker as a he has sprayed pepper spray or mace in business class, and we can't breathe in business class. And I read huh. that again, and I thought, wait a minute. Now, what's, what went through my 30 years career in my mind? Uh -huh. Leaving Honolulu with that cheap perfume, that flowery stuff they spray in, and, and uh, the whole airplane would fill up with it. Somebody sprayed it, you know, everybody smelled like puka flowers or something. Or dropping a duty-free rum somewhere in the airplane, everyone would smell it. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, if this airplane were pressurized at altitude uh -huh. and some sprayed something as bad as pepper spray or mace, both mm -hmm. of which are not legal. Could go through the whole plane. Including the hijackers would be suffering from it. And yet both of those flight attendants were on the phone for 27 minutes. Neither of them ever coughed, choked, gagged, or said... My eyes are killing me. I can't breathe. I, I'm having trouble. They didn't. You see what they said? There was gas only up in one section. And they talked on the phone for nearly a half an hour. And so she said something else. She said he stood upstairs. And now to somebody else that means nothing. But I know there are only stairs on a 747. She right. was on a 767. No and stairs. I knew, since they were not pressurized uh -huh. and she was calling. Uh-huh. They were on the ground somewhere in a uh -huh. hangar, and there are stairs in every corner of a hangar. And so what I did was I thought, well, then 20 minutes from Boston, let me find where they could be. And I knew that those aircraft, because they were heavy, we landed where they were full of fuel to go from coast to coast. Even though the loads were light, they're still landing what we call heavy in the industry. They needed at least a 10,000-foot runway, and lo and behold, if I didn't find a reserve Air Force base uh -huh. with 18 minutes of Boston. Oh, and perfect. Four yeah. aircraft were taken over remotely using the flight termination system, mm -hmm. which was sold to the airlines mm -hmm. to Boeing first from a company called SPC Corporation. Another Israeli company. Interestingly enough, not only that, the CEO of that company was Rabbi Dov Zakheim, who was also the comptroller of the Pentagon. Dov who Zakheim, who on September the 10th <laughs> announced that there was, what was it, uh, $2 trillion missing? That's very it, yeah, nice. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, they, I come through what, what, and, I, I'm curious, what, what, what do the other professionals in your industry say about your work? Now, these two obviously found it uh, overwhelming, uh, but what's the general reaction? Do people say, ah, well, maybe... Let's are saying you found the missing piece of the puzzle, you put it right on the cover of Methodical uh -huh. Illusion, and you uh, are right on. That's exactly how it happened, and very, very, very supportive. I, I have hundreds of pilots and flight attendants and uh, pursers that are coming forward. They are people who knew the crew members. They knew the protocol, um, hundreds of them. And they're they were, also, they were directly them. related. No, they knew yeah. the, they knew the crew. They knew the people now. Okay. This is fascinating. And, and when you were on last time, I was just sitting, listening, uh, almost with my jaw hanging open at what you were saying. Now I've been studying this for a long time. I've had hundreds of guests on talking about this and here you come along and you reveal what appears to be the truth. And it's been laying around, but no one was ever able to put their hands on it. And did you feel, don't, this isn't cornball stuff, 
Did you feel like you were impelled to do this, almost like there was something else pushing you? Or was it just your own natural inquisitiveness and your professional background? Uh, well, when I first discovered some of the hijackers still alive, I, I knew that something was very much amiss with the official story. And the Barbara and, Olson, Olson phone call. Oh, yeah, all of the phone calls. Because cell phones don't work, uh, and they still don't work English on a specially equipped aircraft. Uh, in 2001, there's no way you could be making a phone call. Flight 93, almost all of the calls, according to the U.S. government. Now, uh -huh. I have to tell you, I had to weed through, wade through uh, a lot of what George Bush said, wild conspiracy theories, things that were written by people that had no knowledge of of how a flight attendant works, uh, how we correspond with the pilots, what our protocols are, nothing. And so they created these wild theories, uh, one of which was like the planes were all flown to Cleveland. Well, I know better because I flew out of Boston first, and uh, it's a two-hour flight to Cleveland. <laughs> so we didn't have enough time for those phone calls to be made. And you can't be flying to Cleveland at altitude and be on a phone for half an hour. Right. which the flight attendants on Flight 11 were. So as I started to dissect through this, I, I, just, I just zeroed in on as much government data as I could. So I, I, I used uh, all of the FBI documents, and these are uh, documents that have been put into court twice. Well, I don't know if you could call the 9-11 Commission court, but it was similar. And yeah. then the Zachariah Masawi trial, the 20th hijack.